Hello, and welcome to the Third Space Podcast, episode number 40, entitled June the 12th, Be With You, Always, which is a really dumb allusion to Star Wars uh, and Star Wars Day, which is on May the 4th, which we totally missed. Uh, The intent was (laughs) to have a Star Wars-related podcast on Star Wars Day, or at the very least, during the month of May, but Daniel and I were both really busy with things here and there and haven't been able to record an episode and I also rewatched all of Star Wars in preparation for this which took a while so apologies for the delay but here it is finally so this episode is totally about Star Wars there's no other fluff in it it's essentially 11 mini reviews of all of the Star Wars movies and the Mandalorian and it's mostly from my perspective. Daniel does chime in since he's seen a lot of this stuff, and we're both fans of Star Wars, um, at least at some point in our lives. So this episode is full of opinions, objectively correct opinions, I might add, uh, as well as spoilers. So if you haven't seen Star Wars for some reason or care about what happens in some of the movies or the shows, then beware, there are spoilers. Um, But... Essentially, this is a combination of praise slash rant, uh, depending on which parts of Star Wars I'm talking about, and it gets a little long. This is a pretty lengthy podcast, and there was tons that I didn't even get to. I took pages of notes while I was watching the movies, trying to have more of an objective eye. But what was in, uh, hopefully you will find entertaining. Maybe you agree with it, maybe you disagree with it, but hopefully you enjoy the discussion. So without further ado, let's take it away. Bennett, this is a podcast with you and me. It's called Third Space. Podcast. Podcast. The Third Space (laughs) Podcast. Coming at you. (laughs) Coming at you. 2022. Um, Have you noticed the date today? Today is the 12th of of June uh, 2022. June the 12th be with you. Oh, Always. yeah, this is, what a time. Is this a transition to, to uh, you know, May the 12th be with you, like, or June the 12th be with you? June, Star, I, I Star almost Wars. did the same thing. You, pro- you might have caught that. I said, I almost said May the 12th be with you, even though <laughs> I was trying to make a joke about June the 12th be with you. Um, yeah, it's not Star Wars Day, but it was Star Wars Day in the past. And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you can do that about any date ever. (laughs) And so because of that today on this podcast, I want to talk about Star Wars. Good Uh, good as date as any, except for May the 4th. So, (laughs) well, actually, you know, we haven't done a podcast in a while and, um, it was after our last one that I thought, you know, it would be cool to do a podcast and talk about Star Wars uh, and we can do it on Star Wars Day, which is May the 4th. Um, but you know, we, we've both been busy, and it actually it took me a long time to watch all of Star Wars again. So uh, this is the first opportunity that we've had. So, but, so today, on this episode of the Third Space Podcast, uh, on the wonderful J- June the 12th, um, I want to talk about Star Wars. It's a movie series that we have both watched and both enjoyed. And we both have at least some kind of relationship to the series. Yeah. And uh, it's a big part of pop culture. And people have a lot of opinions on Star Wars. And I'm no exception to that. So uh, This is exciting, too, because you are uh, perhaps super fan status or near, uh, at least for... Well, we can get into that. And I am, like, casual popcorn going, but had a relationship with it in third grade. It was probably my first... Uh, they re-released the original four, five, and six, mm-hmm. in when we were in third grade. I don't know if you have any memory of this. I didn't understand the re-release, and you just said re-release. And I, when I found out they came out in like the seventies and eighties, I was like, I can't believe there was something good produced that was so old. Because I'm in third <laughs> grade, and anything old is bad. Right. And I loved it, and and was uh, and and David and I actually would uh, argue about who liked it more. A very classic, you know, third grade sort of. No, it's like it's kind of this ownership of it and loving it. So, uh, so yeah, I ha- in third grade, I had this deep uh, connection with it. Uh, pre- so before you, so basically, I'm yeah, a, before I, me, I've liked it longer. Uh, yes, you, know. you have. I mean, you legitimately have. Yeah, like I didn't, I didn't see Star Wars when I was in third grade at the re-release, and I think I might have seen part of one of the classic movies when I was in like fifth grade, 
and but I didn't really watch a, the entire movie for a while. Um, uh, to be clear, when you're in third grade watching a movie as epic as Star Wars, I'm like leaning over and asking my dad like what happened or what does that mean like mm-hmm. i remember that right like needing to be explained some stuff um, yeah so yeah 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 i didn't uh i didn't get hooked on it until a little bit later i don't remember when i first watched it i was probably 12 or 13 maybe and i watched a new hope uh episode four but then when i really started to get into star wars was in um in about eighth grade my uncle uh, gave me some of his old Star Wars books, and I, uh, that's essentially what got me into reading books, and I read a bunch of the Star Wars books, and of course I watched the movies again, and then from that point I was hooked, and I read, I, I mean I have a bookshelf with over 100 Star Wars books on it. That's, um, that's wild, so like as, as someone who doesn't know much about that Star Wars universe, like is it all, is that considered canon or just is not, canon evolving well, again? not anymore because not anymore new, new, like, it, okay. it was once upon a time considered canon uh and then yeah with the disney um the disney buyout back in whenever that was 2014 or 13 something around that time um all of that basically got thrown in the trash can and they used little bits of it here and there in some of the the new the new canon but most of the old stuff got well, hundreds away. of books. It's like, do you just start making a book, like pick the best one and try to make a movie out of it? Like, I can understand, but whether that ticks you off or not, like I can understand. Like, they're like, look, there's this whole hundred Star Wars books. Like, we 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 either got to honor. You can't honor them all in a little series, and you can't expect anyone, like the, the average person, to moviegoer to have watched or read those so yeah. let's just scratch it like that's is that okay to say or does that offend you like what do you what do you do as like a a company who's like all right we're making the next star wars trilogy like what do it you depends. do with that no. it, it depends on the quality of the books uh you know if you have an excellent canon existing and you don't pull from that then that is offensive to you know to both to the quality of the books and the fans who have already enjoyed them if it's not high quality, or if what you if you go your own way and make something that is also you know exceptional, then you know it can be forgiven. Um, so then, so tell me, give me an overview of the books if you could, like in terms of um, hundreds or so books. This is not one author, and I imagine yeah. the the quality so, varies quite a bit. Or yes. and it's just a sprawling universe that has little to in some ways little to do with the originals i imagine if i picked well, up book 80 like i, I might not like well they're, no... they're not it's not one series you know like it's not like one continuous plot thread you know after the classic trilogy um came out uh you know some author would write a story and it would be about you know what happened to luke after empire strikes back or something like that um and uh there there's it wasn't until I may not be exactly correct on the chronology of this since I didn't read them as they came out, but there's one trilogy written by a guy named Timothy Zahn called the Hand of Thrawn or the the Thrawn trilogy, um, and it was really good. It 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 uh, it was about you know what Luke did essentially after the classic movies, and uh, there was this remnant of the Empire, an admiral who was like super smart and uh really crafty and he was trying to take things back over and it was well written and it was a fun trilogy of books and interesting things happened and it was excellent that would have been a gold mine for them to go to and you know make a new movie trilogy um and and the books they cover the whole chronology of star wars so you have you know after the prequels came out you now have books that go from before the prequels all the way through the prequels in the middle of the prequels and classics and then for decades after the, the the classic trilogy, all the way up until you know Luke and Han and Leia are old. Um, now, you know, with respect to the movies, and you know, if you're going to make a sequel trilogy, how do you do that? Because your actors are old now, and so yeah. you know they it would have been very difficult to just pick up right after the Timothy episode Zahn six. Series. You couldn't, yeah, yeah. You know, also, you would have to is this widely either... agreed upon, by the way, that that the Zon series was was very was solid. Like this isn't yes. just like you you happen to like it. It's just if you were to if I were to no. go research, hey, where where what should I read next after watching those movies? They would say, yeah, pick that one up, kind of thing. Yeah, it's very, it's really popular. It's it's probably the best of the books. Uh, and you know when you when you mentioned yeah, there's tons of authors of the books. Some of them are crappy. Some of them are really good. Most of them are pretty 
average, you know, like it, you know, it, like worth it, reading it for a, for a big fan. Yeah, for if a big you, fan. You read a hundred books or more just on Star Wars. Like that's just that's impressive. That's a testament to like the the universe that they've created and the love you have for it. Yeah, and and for a kid too. You know, keep in mind I was in eighth grade, so that was so are these books. High, yeah, are, high they, school, are they young so. adult literature style or not really? It's just they. You know, like, I mean, they are not. They range quote unquote YA lit. There there are young adult Star Wars books I did, which I didn't read. I mean, they are they are books for adults, but you know, it's not like high literature or something yeah Um, yeah it's a summer read it's a beach read kind of thing yeah right so kind of fun but let's uh so so that that's kind of our attachment to star wars um you know it uh, so i want to so all right so let me let me frame what i did so i watched all all the movies all the live action star wars content um recently and took notes on it and so i want to I'm going to talk about yeah. all of that stuff, all the what, movies. In what order did you decide? Like release date, chronology, what did you do? So, yeah, I did kind of a modified chronological order, a release date order. So I watched um, 4, 5, 6, uh, and then 1, 2, 3, um, and then I watched the solo movie, or uh, Rogue One and the solo movie, and then um, 7, 8, 9, and then The Mandalorian. So would have been perfectly in... in conjunction except han solo came out like after one or, or excuse me seven yeah. or no uh, eight i think s- after eight. S- i think it, uh seven seven came out before rogue one yeah but seven and, rogue one eight han solo i believe yeah and then the, yeah yeah i think you're right you just went ahead and watched those two yeah yes i wanted to keep the the, tri- the trilogy movies stuck yeah. together next Makes to each sense. other for for continuity um and so it's going to be uh so like I said, I have opinions. <laughs> I have opinions yeah. on these. And, you know, that's what a lot of this is going to be. Um, but what I tried to do when watching the movies is to watch them with a more objective eye. I tried to do that anyway. Um, and so... Uh, do you want to start by like make, making your opinion known of the overall experience? Or do you want to sort of like... Like, how do you want to do that? And yeah, also, I, like, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll kind of rein you in about, like, we don't need a summary of all the movies and individual mm-hmm. stuff. It's more yes. just, like, interesting patterns and, like, how right. you've seen it evolve over time. And, like, what did Disney overall do to the series? Or mm-hmm. what did the, orig- you know, the, uh, the prequels where they, you know, they have a reputation for being overall bad. But I think the overall reputation is, but the third one's pretty good. But it may be you know, iffy on how much that was worthwhile getting one pretty good movie for two bad ones and that kind of stuff. Would you say that's an yes. accurate, holistic reputation of the prequels? Yes. Um, you know, real hatred toward Jar Jar, uh, <laughs> stiff acting. Uh, yeah. Clone Wars was really bad, I guess, uh, is the reputation. That's the second one, I think. Uh, and then the, thir- the, the new series is almost too in some ways too early for time to tell and then you have like mixed audiences because you have different you have such a large audience for the new ones like and how do how do original star wars fans you know how do they tend to lean toward toward you know like the, your new your young people who are watching marvel movies and star wars and kind of just you know kind of just eating popcorn and liking it all like i don't know so yeah yeah so i i can go ahead and give a an kind of an overarching opinion on things and some categories that we can that we can touch on when we talk about the individual movies so well and and i guess we should also just say that there will be spoilers I'm not, yes I'm and not should we treat should we treat them as like three entities like the original the prequels and then the new uh you know seven eight and nine we can we can do that since and they it, were and all and also the mandalorian and yeah yeah we, we can do that i i, I kind of uh, I mean, there are different categories that you could make. You could have Lucas stuff and Disney stuff. That's an easy That's split to make. Or you could do it by time period in a classic. But my guess sequel. is 7, 8, and 9. I don't know this, but I've heard... Oh, also the, the overarching reputation for The Mandalorian is pretty good. And like, and, and I'm curious of your thoughts because I have no idea what your thoughts are on that. But 7, 8, and 9 is sort of a mixed bag. So right. I'll be curious if yeah. you have... Anyway, because say yeah. all Disney stuff, it seems to be a delineation between 7, 8, and 9 and The Mandalorian. Yeah. So overall, um, you know, my my opinion is that the classic movies four, five, and six are the best. Um, they are classic for a reason. They have it was before the advent of too much CGI. Um, uh, it was a story from the mind of one man, essentially from George Lucas's brain, uh, and it was 
basically a classic hero's journey with strong characters uh, who who all saw development into heroic figures. So that's kind of what that trilogy was about. Yeah, yeah. Then you had the prequel trilogy, which came out you know years afterward after a long gap, and this was in the I would say it's not fair to say the infancy of CGI, but certainly in the toddler years of CGI. Um, although by this point, uh, Lucas had a bajillion dollars, and so was able to get top-notch CGI. Nonetheless, the movies suffer from uh, an insane amount of CGI, and the it probably adult... was aged poorly. Would you say has it aged poorly, in, or is it all in right? some in some places it has? But but really, what I think is the most interesting thing about all the CGI is how it changed the content of the movies because it gave the direct it gave the creators so many more options that they were able to really go wild, which sounds like maybe a good thing, but when I was watch, re-watching these, I kept coming back to a philosophical idea that I feel really strongly about, which is that limitation is what allows us to be creative. And with some of the limitations of what can be displayed on a movie screen removed, I felt like it, it actually became less creative in some ways. Um, it it was too wide-reaching without being focused on the important bits of plot and character. That said, that that's one complaint about the prequels. Um, but uh, there were some technical issues, you know, with regards to acting and stuff. But at the end of the day, I still enjoy the prequels because the world building was really good. You learn a lot about how the universe was prior to what we saw in four, five, and six, and it did eventually tell. A somewhat compelling story so i the the prequels are certainly not as good as the classics but they're i, I quite enjoy them can i i want to get an idea of how the discrepancy between you're saying that that, that the origin or the classic the original four five and six is like perhaps a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10 on uh the uh greatness scale of, of film or of, of sci-fi or whatever i don't know it's just it's up there it's one of the best yeah. uh, so i have where some numbers the... I, I have some okay numbers good i, I would love the numbers with yeah. you um but first let me uh let me talk about the last um, yeah sorry the, the last set so <laughs> you're the, way more the, prepared the... than i am clearly <laughs> it's okay yeah the uh the sequels um how can i put it are garbage <laughs> um the the sequel movies are no longer from the mind of George Lucas. Uh, they lose the benefit of any coherence in terms of world building. Uh, there are tons of issues with the setting and the plot, just even the broad, in the broadest sense. Um, they're made by different. Well, J.J. Uh, Abrams directed the first and the third, or episode seven and episode nine, and uh, Ryan Johnson made episode eight. So they're disjointed in that, that way. Yeah. They have totally different thematic uh, underpinnings. Like, whereas the classics were Hero's Journey, heroic figures, the prequels were, it wasn't exactly Hero's Journey, it was a character piece on Anakin and his fall and his turn into Darth Vader, but it, but it also featured heroic characters and classic themes. The sequels, however, totally throw all that out the window and are essentially subversive um they're not about heroic characters they're about trashing heroic characters um just postmodernism in a nutshell kind of thing <laughs> it, it it is there's a lot of that I, I feel like they um they're very disjointed as well so even the subversion can't be kept straight exactly um there's uh there's a lot of copy paste uh, so there's some mix between subversion and cash grab in the sequels. Uh, there's a lot. The J.J. Abrams stuff is more cash grabby, and the Ryan Johnson stuff is less cash grabby and almost totally a big f you to anyone who cares about Star Wars, um, which which we can get into. But it gives uh, it gives credit like like to give it some credit. It feels Star Wars. It's like impressionistic. It's like uh, the music and the sounds and the and the images and the names like a name like Kylo Ren and and like like and the the bots and some of the like it feels Star Warsy in this mm. very. I mean, I mean, I know what I'm making is a shallow observation, but it certainly like feels of high quality cinematic like 
awe. Like it's it's epic and it's got the music and it like. Am I right about that, or do you disagree? Like it feels so Star Warsy on this very surface level moment, like a like a screen grab or like a if you could watch a trailer of it, it would feel like it. I mean, it feels Star Warsy in the sense that a Prius feels like a Corvette. It's <laughs> it's got four wheels and the- it's got four <laughs> wheels. You sit in it and drive, but you don't feel the engine rumble when you press the accelerator, and you're not people aren't looking at you the same way as when you're driving your Corvette, it's not fun to drive like a Corvette is. It doesn't have the same soul, the same engine underneath. So yeah, superficially, the sequels feel Star Warsy. They use some of the same sound effects. Yeah, they play, they have an open scroll. But of scroll. course they do. Of they play the music. They do. Yeah. But 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 here here's what I'll tell you. Even though they utilize the bits and pieces from the other Star Wars movies, they totally fail to integrate them in a compelling and meaningful and fun way. It's an utter failure uh, on, on their part, and so that that's my and that's my overall take on the series. So anyone listening, if you hate that take, then well, you can stop right now because you know the rest is essentially going to be you know hit trying to hit home, hit home at those points. <laughs> yeah. um, so well, let's, can we? Can I, what about the Mandalorian? Can I ask for that as a separate? This is the series, right? And I have no idea yeah. how many seasons, how many episodes yeah, per season. I don't know anything about it. I know it's got Baby Yoda, and that is a cultural like thing right now. But I don't know much else. So yeah, like so I literally the, don't know the plot. If it's Boba Fett or in his tales, I, I literally don't know. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we talk about that at the end? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, and we'll, we'll we'll wrap we'll wrap with that one. It's a because like my journey through the movies was up and down and it's a it's a nice place to end on on the mandalorian cool yeah um so let's just if you don't mind we'll just uh dip our toes into each each movie chronologically and we don't have to do a deep dive on on all of them but i can kind of sum up the let's strengths do it because I know, you've it. watched uh the original series the, the th- first or four five and six sorry i keep bouncing around with language but like you've watched those a lot i'm imagining could you yeah, give I've me watched an them estimate a- uh, I mean, at least a dozen times. Yeah, would you say you watch them at least once every other year, if not more, on average? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. That's probably pretty close, something like There's that. There's probably been times that you've gone three or four years without watching, and then maybe one time you've watched it twice in a year, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I, when I was a kid, I watched them maybe more than once a year, um, That both for the classics and the prequels. Uh, lately, I haven't. You know, I haven't rewatched them as as often. Okay. Um, so I do. I also mentioned I have a number a number scale. Um, so I rated I rated them all on a number scale and on a one to ten scale, and it's a local Star Wars only one to ten scale. So if I give something a ten, it's not because it's the best movie ever, or or even is shoulder to shoulder with best movies ever. It's the best Star Wars content it's the there is. The epitome of so there is a ten out there. There is a ten. Only, yes. Is there it's, one ten or is there a tie? If it's two tens, is, it's tied for the most Star Warsy thing. Yes, that's yeah. You you've got it. And so th- since this is a normalized scale to Star Wars, there's a zero and there's a ten. So there's a worst Star Wars and there's a best Star Wars, and everything else is relative to those. Yeah, got um, it. So episode four, A New Hope. Um, it's a nine out of ten. It's an excellent start. To Star Wars, uh, the takeaway, you know, as I mentioned, is it's basically a classic hero's journey story. Um, and it gets a lot of points for novelty you know, because it's the first mo- first movie in a series. Um, everything is fresh. All of the world is new. Everything you see is exciting. And when you see the Star Destroyer you know, flying above the camera and shooting lasers, that's cool. You see all the ship designs. You see the X-Wings. All of it is fresh and new. You see lightsabers, that's cool. All the, the different planets, Tatooine with the two suns, all of that is really cool. Yeah. I, I would say the strength in in episode four is uh, the, the world building, all that creativity, and then a very simple and clear good versus evil framing. Uh, all, all of that makes it approachable, and there, there's no complexity or confusion it's just you can lose yourself in the in the movie while you're watching it yeah and so it did a, an excellent job with that and some of the things to me after watching all of all of the series that makes episode four stand out is well firstly it 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 
it tells you what it's going to do. So even in the opening scroll of the movie, it tells you who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. It tells you that the Empire is evil and Princess Leia will save her people and restore freedom to the galaxy. That's her goal. Um, and so there's no, there's no question about what you're about to watch. Um, you know who the good guys are and your job as an audience member is to root for the good guys and want to see the bad guys defeated. And so, you know, you could say that that is simplistic, but it's also, it, it gets a lot of the mess out of the way and lets you just enjoy the movie for what it is. Right. It's, it's in that regard, it's comfortable yet set in a novel way. It's, it's giving you comfortable themes with, and tried and true themes, like deeply embedded in our desires and emotions and mm -hmm. yet presents that in a novel way. Yeah. Yes. Um, Another interesting thing about uh, episode four is that the main characters don't appear very early in the movie. Like, I mean, Leia shows up really quickly. She's in the intro, but she doesn't get a lot of characterization early. Luke doesn't show up until 17 minutes into the movie, and Han doesn't show up until 40 minutes into the movie. So it's a very I slow pr uh, progression, a slow introduction to the plot and the characters of the movie. You know, I recall uh, Han Solo not showing up until, for a while, and that makes sense because to introduce him. I mean, you can do, you can do that. But what between the beginning and seventeen minutes in, that's that's is surprising to know that Luke doesn't make an appearance until seventeen in. Like what? I I mean, if I recall, it's the, it's Darth Vader, it's some opening stuff like that. But and mm -hmm. but it, but I thought it, then it pretty quickly uh, pan to what is it? Tan, Tantooine. Pan Tatooine. Tatooine. Yeah. yeah, Tatooine, and, and then, you know... It, it does, but it it's uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO escaping from Darth Vader, and it follows them when they land on Tatooine, and it's not until they get bought by Luke. Uh, so how do you uncle. feel about the pacing? I mean, it's an older movie, right? Like 78, 79, something like that? And like yeah, 76, is, the pa is this a, Is this an old school pace or old movie issue that they're a little slower, or is this just more deliberate and thank God it's not throwing so many lasers at us immediately you know yeah so i think i think it's a combination you're definitely right that older movies tend to have different ideas about pacing and you you know sometimes that can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bad thing i think there's also just an inevitable slowness to uh the first movie of a trilogy you know the establishing movie you have to do some establishment like when i think about lord of the rings for example, Fellowship of the Ring is a slower movie with a slow introduction as well. Um, and so, you know, I think some of that might be unavoidable. I don't know that I would say it's a problem, not not a huge problem with uh, episode four, the slow introduction. I know that when I was a kid, I didn't like episode four as much because it I thought it was slow and nothing happened for a while. But now that I appreciate you know, the characterization and the world building more, I, I like it. I like it better. I mean, it's 9 out of 10. It's almost almost the best yeah. of Star Wars. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an, another strength of Episode Four is the character progression in the movie. So, you know, they do a good job at having the main characters. Well, firstly, all the characters are distinct, and they all have personalities that are, uh, I guess, believable and consistent. And then even the secondary characters are enjoyable too. So Luke, Luke is the protagonist, even though he doesn't show up until 17 minutes. Um, and when it starts, he's annoying and whiny and immature, insecure, as someone who's not yet a hero would be. And then over the course of the movie, he matures, experiences challenges. Um, you know, his he's separated off from his comfortable world when his aunt and uncle are murdered by the Empire. And he has to go on an adventure and, you know, discover his, uh, you know, his destiny, um, yeah, I guess you yeah. could say. And he's le led by Obi-Wan, the wise old Jedi, um, who, you know, he's, a, he's the wisdom of the past being passed on to Luke in the present, who makes use of that in order to be the good guy and defeat evil. So it's all very classic, but done in an engaging and entertaining way. Um, right. Han uh, has his own character progression arc that's really good. He's a cocky, arrogant smuggler guy who doesn't care about anyone but himself. And then over the course of the movie, of course, he 
kind of softens up and learns to respect Luke and, you know, swoops in in, in the climax to save the day and essentially join the rebellion. Um, Leia has less character development in episode four. She kind of starts as a feminine, beautiful, but strong uh, character who resists the Empire, and she kind of stays that way through the movie. She's spunky um, and kind of spoiled. I guess she softens a little by the end, but but her character progression is is not as good in episode four. It's kind of a will they, won't they with Han, maybe? Or or is that more later on? It's more later. In episode four, it's just the very beginnings. Actually, you're not sure in episode four whether Luke and Leia are going to end up together or Han and Leia are going to end up together. You don't know that in episode four. There's just a lot of banter, uh, which is fun. Like They do a good job. It's charming, and the banter is is good. Um, But the romance isn't all that heavy in episode four. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's, episode four has a lot of strengths in that way. Um, there's some lore stuff that they introduce, you know, with the force and Jedi, like in episode four, you don't really know anything about the force, what it is or how it works. You don't know who the Jedi are. They're mostly forgotten. Um, and all of that stuff is mysterious until later movies fill in all of those gaps. And just as like it's a slower pacing, so is your, your review of it, right? <laughs> like, huh. it, well, but I think it's worthy worthy of slowing down for for the beginning and saying why it's worth what it's worth. I can't imagine we could if even even if you spent ten minutes on each movie, like it would be that's ninety minutes right there. You know, you're right. Um, yes. So, yeah. So that that's that's episode four. Yeah. I, I, there's no need to say much else uh, about it. It's it's solid. It's good a good establishing movie. And I, you know, I like it. So, moving on to episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. This is the 10 out of 10. This is the best. Yeah, I agree. Uh, This is the best Star Wars that Star Wars has, uh, has, has been. Like, this is the best Star Wars has ever been. It hasn't gotten better. It takes everything from episode four and it turns it up a notch. So the special effects <laughs> by adding snow exactly you know you know my taste <laughs> that's your preference is snow. <laughs> snow do you think your your preference for snowy landscapes might have been shaped at an early age watching this and loving the movie and therefore I think it's you possible kind of a, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> it's highly possible um so it, it I mean but going from episode four to episode five it's clear that the budget got a bump. And maybe the the talent that was involved in the movie got a bump. All the actors got better. Well, that's one thing about Episode Four: the acting wasn't wonderful. Like Luke wasn't Mark Hamill as Luke wasn't that great of an actor. Neither was Carrie Fisher. It was fine though. It was, it was fine. Right. It wasn't compelling. Yeah. It, it was wasn't fine. Winning acting or anything. Yeah. Han Solo was definitely Harrison Ford as Han Solo was definitely the best actor in the movie. Yes. Uh, yes. And maybe old Obi Wan, he was pretty good too. Um. Uh-huh. But it was but just kind of. I would what... argue that old Obi Wan playing an old stock character in some ways, not to disrespect Obi Wan at all, but like if you just play an old wise guy, like there's a lot of people, old men that can just do that, just kind of You're, by speaking yeah. slowly. Whereas I think having spunk and being sassy and yeah. sassy Han Solo, sassy Solo, <laughs> sassy Solo, <laughs> that, that takes uh, that takes some uh, takes something else. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, anyway, the acting did get a lot better in episode five. Even Luke improved a lot. Leia improved a lot. Um, and Han was consistent. He stayed very Plus, very you, can, good. you don't have to do the world building to that degree. You can jump into action more. Yep. Yeah, and they did that. Um, cinematography got better. They took a more complex approach to the plot because there were two branching storylines. Luke, Luke's branch, which was essentially the discover branch. He had to discover you know, Yoda and about his father and about the force and then there was the han and leia branch which was escape you know escape from the empire try to run from darth vader uh and so you it was complex you weren't following just one thread you were swapping back and forth between the two which made the movie feel dynamic and it, it kept you on the edge of your seat in a way um although i will say that you know it's interesting because the plot wasn't clear when you start episode five it's not clear where the movie is going to take you in episode four you kind of get the sense that okay it's good versus evil you know you're going to have good guys and they're going to fight the bad guys and that's going to be where the movie goes in episode five 
it's you don't know where you're going to go. Like you don't know if it's going to be good guys beating bad guys. When it starts, it's the rebels getting um, uh, getting attacked on Hoth and fleeing, and so you don't you don't actually know where this movie is going to end up. Right. Uh, w- which can be disorienting, but Episode Five, Empire Strikes Back, they save it by making the moment to moment motivations always very clear. Uh, they always make they always tell you in the scene what the character is experiencing and what they want to experience. So Luke, you know, they they show that oh he um, you know he wants to go seek out Yoda and he tell he essentially tells you that and he embarks on that journey and yes. Han Leia you know, there's his escape most of the time so they say oh we have to flee to an asteroid belt or whatever and then they do that and you see what happens. From there. Is this the movie in which, when he goes to visit Yoda, perhaps even before finding Yoda, I'm, I'm having trouble placing this scene where it's a move, like an acid trip or a dream sequence where he's he battles Darth Vader yeah. in in the tree in like in a tree or somewhere in the in the, yep. in the swampy woods, chops off his head and reveals that it's him, it, his, his own his face. Head and, yes, yeah, yeah that's what. Be- yeah, I love that because it's a very uh, hero's journey. Like like ultimately, we all. These are like the hero's journey as psychological roadmap that like yeah we, we always have a demon or the bad yes. we always have a bad guy to face but really the bad that we face is us and so yes that, like, really that's exactly that right it's exactly right they they knock the themes out of the park and in this movie um, facing one's inner darkness is certainly one of the primary themes of the movie like it's got very wholesome themes uh, and, all and the so classic that's a sophisticated idea I mean like I mean I know, I know it's almost a classic narrative but it's still that's sophisticated when you really unpack that it's not just the outer evil of the world you're going against it's yourself so right well i mean that's what you know in episode five we got all of the lore about the jedi and the sith and the force none of that existed in episode four it was just a you know kind of a mention about the force and some some stuff that obi-wan talked about a little bit but in episode five, we learned about what it was. And Yoda, you know, he taught Luke as he was teaching us that uh, the Jedi virtues are calm and patience and acting in self-defense. And the dark side is anger, fear, and aggression. And, like, all of the themes and lore really got squashed into Luke's training, which was a great way to do it. It was an excellent way to do it because we kind of grew at the same time that we watched Luke grow in the movie, which gave us an attachment to the themes of the movie, which meant that when Luke, you know, eventually faced Darth Vader and was being tempted, it felt compelling to us. So it did an excellent job tying all of that stuff together. Um, the characterization just improved. You know, Luke, we got to see him actually struggle with impatience and uh, questioning his legacy and his ability to, uh, you know, to essentially become a Jedi. Um, Han and Leia, this is where we really start to see their romance begin and Han soften up and Leia also soften up and them kind of admit to each other that um, that they love each other by the end of the movie. So all, all of that stuff is entertaining and uh, there's consequential development. So it's all it's all really great. And of course there's snow, which is you know the high point, <laughs> high point of the movie. Yeah. Oh, and you can't forget the iconic reveal of Darth Vader is Luke's father. Like that's one of the most, uh, the best twists in all of movies, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's if you, look, I bet you, if you Google best twists in movies, that's it, that's it, you know? Right. Um, I actually, I don't have, I only have one minor gripe. It's ultra minor. I only have one complaint about uh, The Empire Strikes Back, and that's like, there's this one part where after Luke uh, gets his hand chopped off fighting Darth Vader. And he kind of falls off. Do you remember that? He says, no, no. And then he kind yeah, of like yeah. falls off. He like, uh, he just kind of falls into a tube from hundreds of very meters in the air. Up, right? Very yeah. high up. He just falls into a tube. It look the special effects that they use for that looks goofy. It just seems impossible. And I don't know. I didn't like that. Yeah, why even but, have him fall if, if you're going to just introduce something that disrupts our suspension of disbelief, you know? Right. Well, I, I guess they needed to get him away from Darth Vader because, and, and I guess they wanted they wanted to at least suggest that Darth Vader might think that Luke was dead um, or okay. there was no reason I mean, to pursue him. It does accomplish some plots. It does accomplish yeah, those. But, 
But man, it seems like they could have done they could have done it that better because it looked really goofy. But that's so <laughs> minor. That's so tiny, t- tiny and minor. Yeah. But yeah, episode five, best Star Wars movie, uh, infinitely rewatchable. Like all the settings are great. So they, they did an excellent job. And that's your favorite too, I guess. It is. I mean, the next one was close for me. Well, not no. I'm gonna guess you. Can I guess what you gave it? I'm guessing yeah, you gave Return it. of the Jedi an eight. Um, I don't know though. Uh, maybe a nine, but I'm gonna guess eight. I gave it a, se- a seven. Okay. So you're, you're All right. Close. So, yeah, Return of the Jedi. It, it it's a disappointing movie in some ways because you know you you have a big step up from four to five. Everything got turned up a notch, and you you got a lot closer to the characters, and you got invested in their narratives. And then from five to six, well. That improvement just kind of stopped. Um, the The production quality was pretty much the same, good, but the same. The characters didn't really advance that much, and the feel of the movie changed. It episode six felt much more like a kids movie than an adventure, um, you know, an adventure movie. That what do you mean the introduction tra- of the uh, what are they called? The little the, the Ewoks. The Ewoks, and yeah. Right. I mean, I really liked the. I mean, it's the redwood, you know. Sure, it was scenes a, and stuff. Yeah, on, like, on indoor, really cool. the yeah, forest, the forest, um, on indoor was was really cool. Although, not, I mean, it wasn't otherworldly really, but it was cool. It was a good setting. Uh, I mean, that's another complaint about about episode six for me is the settings because you basically have Tatooine, the desert, which you've seen before. I mean, Tatooine wasn't interesting really in the first place. Right, right. Um, and then you have Endor, which is the forest and you know, that's that's really it as far as settings go in episode six. So to me, it kind of lacks a little bit on the settings. Uh, although I will say that it has a big space battle, which is like that's the that's one of the best things in Star Wars. And sadly, it lacks and for for a movie called Star Wars, having a war <laughs> in the stars. There aren't that many space battles. And the one in episode six is really cool to see all the ships and see them flying around, shoot stuff. And yeah some of my favorite parts of star wars uh and they, they do have that in the movie um and that's but, uh, to your point that like these these scenes i've always something i appreciate about star wars is when i'm watching transformers or some other action i've said this before but i like i zone out during overwrought action scenes that are sort of meaningless and they're spectacles and they're visual eye candy but they don't tell a story but i think star wars fairly consistently at least in the original trilogy that like they're telling a story even through the action scenes the, yes. the fighting in which i'm i so then i find myself immersed because i am looking for narrative points and I'm, it's it's telling its own story instead of just having buildings crumble and explosions it's yes it's uh, telling me something and so i pay attention right exactly and even during like the lightsaber fights between luke and darth vader you know there's it's not just choreography. In fact, the choreography isn't even that great. No, it isn't that great, but it's compelling. Like, it's compelling, yeah. and they talk to each other, you know, and it's it's more about the conflict between the evil Darth Vader, the father, and the noble, heroic Luke, the son. And it's about that conflict, and so you're engaged in trying to see how that conflict is going to play out instead of being focused on spinny, bright lightsabers flying around and sparks going everywhere. Um, like that's not the point of the fight scene. It's not spectacle, it's development. And so that that's a strength of the classic movies. Um, yeah. Now I'll also say with respect to episode six, and one, one reason why I don't rate it as highly, you know, there's definitely the, the more childish aspect. The Ewoks, they're not terrible, but I also don't love them and they kind of I overstay. Don't mind them. Other they than overstay their it's welcome. A cash grab. Yeah, it's a cash grab and it's explicit and it's a little disappointing. But. And and there's also in the special editions in the you know after they added CGI back in there's a scene in Jabba's palace there's a CGI song do you remember this where that there's an alien that sings oh uh, yeah 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 it's horrible <laughs> it yeah. is horrible it's a terrible edition it clashes yeah. visually yeah. everything <laughs> it's a terrible edition and it brings down the movie an entire point like it just because <laughs> it's at the beginning of the movie too. And man, it's rough. It just That's it gives easy. the whole movie a bad feel. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, 
But other than that, it's fine. You know, the, Luke, it's cool to see Luke kind of become a badass Jedi. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's unfortunate that in all of Star Wars up to this point, we never get to see Luke be a truly badass Jedi. We only right. get to see him in Episode Six when he's kind of, sort of becoming a Jedi. Like, I mean, at some point he's wearing own. black, right? And he's like yeah, really that's confident it. himself, and I, yeah. I like that. Me too. Um, but you know, he's still new. He's still fresh. He certainly wouldn't be called a Jedi Master in Episode right. Six. He would be, you know, I mean, he had he was not even formally taught how to do much of anything. Um, so it would be, you know, when I was imagining what the sequel trilogy would be like, I was like, oh man, Luke's going to be a master. He's going to be better than Yoda was. He's going to be right. doing crazy stuff. And of course that didn't turn out to be the case, but, um, <laughs> unless you count being shot dying. at a in episode eight. And then, yeah. And, and just nothing. keeling over dead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> that the, was like, the la- for me, the worst moment in all of Star Wars, but we'll go back. Well, yeah. anyway, we'll go. The the last thing I want to mention about um, Return of the Jedi is just the theme. It, it's relatively thematically light. There's not much going on thematically in episode se- uh, six, which is another reason why I don't think okay, it sticks that, that, with me. I'd lost my train of thought, but th- this is okay. So, do you think though uh, this happens like, when you tie the knot or you put a bow on a story? You have to you have to give answers, and uh, mm-hmm. all the fun in storytelling is asking questions. Will they? Won't they? Whether yeah. it's the love interest or the victory over the you know the bad guys, or or will you overcome your internal struggles? Whatever it is, asking those questions is riveting. It's what keeps us on the edge of our seat. It's what creates suspense. And You're then, right. as a final film to whatever the series is, you have to. You have have to give answers. get rid of all those fun questions yeah and that's just and that's gonna leave you going okay even if you gave us satisfactory answers it's either unsatisfying answers or, or satisfying answers and so if they are satisfying you go okay well now i know and it's just kind of meh or it's mm-hmm. unsatisfying and you're ticked off or you kind of uh leave some open-ended stuff for the future in which just leaves us a sense of waiting and and, and that's also unsatisfying in its own way so i just think that the the cap of any trilogy or of any story uh is is bound to disappoint a a large swath of people yeah yeah i think you're right um i think if you have to pick a route you the best way to do it is to just give just wrap everything up in as satisfying a manner as you can and yes you lose you know all of the further questions but things have to come to an end and if you do a good job and it's that you make characters that you care about and a storyline that's fulfilling then you know it comes yeah well, know, it comes so close when you've developed your story you have the end in mind and knowing that luke's yes. gonna be that master jedi or whatever like you 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 have to have that end in mind i mean i suppose if you're doing a tv show you could just be writing episode to episode and no idea but then it's directionless and all of that so right. it needs well, to make sense so yeah you're right i think you i think you, i'm a, i'm a fan of straightforward answers uh yes. and like you just gotta go yep and even if it's a yes he is now he's elected to be on team good but he'll always have a little struggle you can do that you can introduce some tension that's not perfectly tied you know like mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be perfectly clean but it should be clear yeah so um Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think that culturally, right now, we struggle with endings and with closure. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a financial motivation for that. You know, you always want to leave the door open for a sequel. But I think that the the um, the stories suffer for that. Like, yeah. it's almost like having a climax and having a resolution are you know, you kind of don't want to have a resolution because you always want to be able to pick up and go with another story. And I don't think that's good for stories. Stories have to have a resolution. Yes. So. Yes. But yeah, episode six, the resolution is fine. It's good. I mean, I, the final scenes with Luke, uh, basically, um, redeeming Darth Vader are good. Darth Vader being redeemed is good. And that's so, the only, the only theme in the movie is redemption. Essentially, um, is Darth Vader, Luke trying to bring Darth Vader back to the light and eventually succeeding. And that that scene where he talks with Darth Vader with his helmet off at the end is basically the thematic pinnacle of the movie. So the original trilogy it earns a score of 
uh, 9, 10, and 7 for a score of, what is that, 20, 26? Uh, oh. out, of third, out of a perfect 30. Uh, so a 26 is pretty pretty good, uh, pretty strong, pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they're, I mean, they're great. And, like, actually, they are the best. They are the best of Star Wars. Oh, what about Wars. the ending? The really, the, the goofball ending with the Ewoks and the dancing, right? That's oh, what, how yeah, it I have a right. Yeah, I have a bullet point about that. Um, yeah, I don't like that. They shouldn't have done it. <laughs> Actually, like I don't, I don't mind some of it, but what really bugged me is that in the special editions they added in, like Naboo, the the planet from um, the prequels with the Gungans on it, like they added that in, and they added Coruscant, the the capital planet that's the city, they added that stuff in, and it's like those don't belong in this movie. Like we haven't seen those planets at all. So if you're watching for the first time, you're like, who the hell are these guys? These frog looking things celebrating? Like that doesn't make sense. So yeah, n- you're right. I I remember that now. Yeah, strange. So, but still, not enough to tank the movie for sure. And compared to, I think it just it gives, it leaves the taste of a kids movie as it sing like basically singing its way out of a vic yeah. you know like a victory and celebration. Like that's just a that's just like yep, this is a we 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 can expand our audience to kids a little or even more. Uh, let me be clear up when i complain about it being a kids movie like i'm not wanting edginess you know like i don't want it to be dark and edgy i I think that that's kind of what the sequels ended up trying to they pushed it in a dark and edgy way in a lot of ways and that's not what i want i just want it to be not so casually like corny and childish you know like episode five had its humor and it had its light spots Episode four had the same way, but episode six, like they just took it a little too far with some of their attempts at comedic relief. They were just, it was very childish and the Ewoks especially and that stupid singing. I mean, isn't there some story about Ewoks him trying to uh, sell like, you know, like he wanted to get some toys, a teddy bear style toy and they're like, fine. And something about his like nephew or something. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure the details of outside of the movies but that, that, i wouldn't be surprised because the action figures were of course wildly profitable so all right you want to move on to the prequels Let's move on yeah all right so the prequels are they're meaningful in one way because you know they came out right that was 1999 when episode one came out what we were in like fifth grade sixth grade thing. i just remember pizza hut and pizza other hut promos like we're, Mount, we're all the, on the can, Mount soda Mount cans Dew. yeah Mount yeah, yeah. Very I remember these stuff of promos for kids. I, yeah. Like this is clearly going for your for that. Yes, so. I mean I love Pizza Hut as a kid, and I would like beg my mom to take me to Pizza Hut so I could get a personal pan pizza and a star the Star Wars thing that came with it. You know, it was some themed Star Wars. Oh man, when you're thing. a kid and it's all wrapped in like yes, we loved the food, no doubt, but wouldn't we have to admit that there was something like. I'm a kid, and, and I'm like totally buying into the narrative Pizza Hut has produced for me. It's like this is being a kid, and like you're with your friends, and you've maybe read some books and kind of I don't know. It's all like wrapped in culturally to like this is what I'm like supposed to do <laughs> for fun, and like it feels that I cannot replicate that. Like, like I love food more than I did as a kid, but like I did. Like it's hard to top my excitement for Pizza Hut, so it was clearly just like, and 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 somehow I mean, there's nothing to it, right? It's just an, a graphic printed on a cheap cup, and you just yeah. like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> like so I'm gonna, cool. I'm gonna it's look Darth at Maul. it. It's a Darth Maul <laughs> cup. Yeah. Uh, oh my god, he got the Darth Maul one. I want that one. I like, want uh, that one. No, no, I got the Queen Amidala one. I yeah, disappointed. Like, oh no, Jar Jar oh, Beans. <laughs> Although, oh, yeah, so. <laughs> Well, there's also the feeling, like, because, you know, when I was in sixth grade or whatever, I hadn't yet gotten into Star Wars, really, uh, you know, I might have seen bits and pieces of the classic trilogy, but I wasn't a fan, and I hadn't read the books at that point yet, but you could tell that it was a cultural event that Star Wars was getting another movie, you know, after a big gap, Um, you know, people older than us were super excited, adults were excited, Everyone was excited, and that just bled over to me being excited as a kid. Yes. I really latched onto that, um, and so it was probably around that time that I wa- I actually did watch the classic um, the classic movies. But 
So the prequels are interesting because they're prequels. And, you know, at the time, prequels... I mean, this is maybe the most popular instance of a prequel being made. Um, a prequel to Star Wars instead of a sequel, which seems like it would be the right thing to do, right? The actors would have been at a reasonable age to go yeah, ahead and no. do sequels for that. But instead, Lucas decided to do prequels. I guess he really wanted to tell well, the prequels story. Prequels getting hot? I mean, that was around the first time I'd ever heard of the word prequel. Yeah, you know? right. But I guess he really wanted to do a movie about about Anakin Skywalker, about the, the creation of Darth Vader, which is actually, you know, Darth Vader is one of the most iconic characters to exist, and he's certainly one of the most gripping characters in the classic movies. And so it's reasonable to want to make an origin story for Darth Vader. So I don't have any problem with that being the uh, the setting and the plot for the prequel movies. Yeah. Um, now, I will say, though, that episode one, um, The Phantom Menace, by the way, oh, by the way, which I give a five out of ten, so I'll go ahead and give you the score here, five. Okay. Yeah. Um, it kind of doesn't need to exist. So that's my primary gripe with episode one is that... <laughs> that's a major gripe, let's be honest. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big gripe because the way they did it, there's a I lot mean, of stuff... That's almost a death, a death note, or that's like a, to, to say something like note i don't know why i use the word note but like if that's your gripe like you don't need to exist that then like or you you don't exist for a reason is what you're saying it's like well then then why does it exist why is it worth engaging with you know right so if if the purpose of the prequels is to is to be about anakin skywalker and his his fall into darth vader episode one doesn't really hit a lot of the necessary pieces there now it does hit some it's not totally empty like you know based on the clues dropped in the classic trilogy and where we see darth vader end up we know that his name is anakin skywalker he was a really good pilot he knew obi-wan um he fought in the clone wars that was dropped in the classic trilogy that's about any false to the dark side that's about it that's about all we know about darth vader prior to where we see him in the classic trilogy and in episode one all we learn is okay now we know who anakin skywalker is we see him as a boy we we learn he's a good pilot and we see him meet obi-wan and that's really it and those facts could have been established in my opinion in a much more entertaining way that meant more to his character development because he didn't get a t i mean it was fine but it felt like wasting a lot of time in the movie it started on tatooine there's a lot on tatooine um i guess it didn't start the beginning of the movie wasn't actually on tatooine but we spent a lot of time on tatooine and the pod race like the pod race was really cool and like it was visually stunning the sound design was excellent on the pod race but it didn't feel like it mattered much to star wars um and so, I don't know, a lot it's of the movie... It's sort of an indulgent scene of visuals, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the movie, while watching it, I felt, okay, why does this matter? I mean, why is this important? Like, Obi-Wan, who is an important character, actually didn't play much of a role in Episode One. He was the Padawan to Gwygon, who was a great character, um, but, like, Obi-Wan just kind of wasn't really involved that much. And, it, I don't know, it seems like what you would want to do, if I was making Episode One... I would have not had Naboo in the movie with all the Gungans and stuff. I would have made the primary planets Alderaan and Tatooine. Alderaan, which you know gets blown up in Episode Four by the Death Star, and in Episode Four we don't care about it. It's just some planet, you know. Apparently Leia is from there and it's peaceful and it gets blown up, and but we don't really care because we've never seen it before. If they would have fleshed out Alderaan in Episode One, then we would have had an attachment to it and it would have made it getting blown up in episode four, all that more impactful. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Instead, we got Naboo, which is something we never heard of before. And we got the Gungans, who, you know, I think they get a lot of flack. Jar Jar gets a lot of flack, more than he deserves. He wasn't great. I don't I don't love Jar Jar, but it just wasn't, he wasn't that bad. The worst thing about Jar Jar was the fact that he was CGI, <clears throat> not that he was annoying. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, I mean, to, to be clear, I haven't <clears throat> seen it since I saw that it back so like a lot wow, of wow you haven't seen it in that long right yeah like it's almost like wow. yeah it's been i really haven't <laughs> like wow. i was going to rewatch it recently i watched four five six seven eight nine but i uh, yeah. just 
didn't didn't watch the sequels or prequels right. excuse me <clears throat> well there's some other issues with the movie too like the, the 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 kind of conflict premise of the movie is that it's really boring there's like a tax blockade on the planet and that's the, the conflict and so they're that like is the trade very bad <laughs> the, the trade federation has like a droid army and they blockade a planet for greedy reasons and that's kind of it like i don't know i just thought it wasn't very interesting. I mean, you got to start somewhere, and you can't just jump right in and have the Empire or whatever. And I do respect the decision to slowly to show the creation of the Empire. And, you know, over the course of the three movies, they show how the Emperor comes to be. All that is really good. And the world building is excellent. Getting to see what the Old Republic was like is so cool. And all the old starships and... Yeah, the Jedi Order, all that is excellent. That that is what makes Episode One worth what one, two, and three worth watching is learning about how the galaxy used to be um, before the Empire. So that's all wonderful, and George Lucas does an excellent job at fleshing out the the world. That's what makes it fun to watch, um, and it's just unfortunate that the details like the acting <laughs> and the plot <laughs> are lacking. Uh, the acting is so bad. It's shockingly bad. Especially with uh, a huge budget. This is, I mean, this isn't A New Hope that was, you know, unknown. Yes, right. Like, this is this is one of the biggest hyped b- movies. So, like, what the heck? What the heck? Yeah, I <laughs> was, mean... Was, the, was it a bad direct? I mean, was it bad direction? It, is that it had to be. It had to be bad direction, right? Because, I mean, um, Natalie They're Portman... Good actors. Nat- Natalie Portman and Liam Neeson are good actors. I mean, they've won right. awards and stuff. And Ewan McGregor is good too. These are objectively good actors acting poorly because they're acting told poorly too. So seemingly, yeah. I mean, the kid actor uh, who played Anakin, you know, you can excuse him because he was a kid, but all of the other actors were on his same level, and they were not kids. They should have done better. I mean, Padme. Um, was horrible like like she was such a terrible actress like she was supposed what should have happened is that she should have been so attractive and charming to audience members that we fell in love with her just like anakin did you know that's the point that's what you want right you want to be able to sympathize with the main character and care about the love interest and man she was just so bland like (laughs) I mean, she didn't get interesting until episode two when she was wearing tight clothes. And so she, you know, <laughs> that's not a good way to to be interested in your love interest in the movie. <laughs> so, yeah. like, you want there to be a little bit more than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, episode one, uh, another, one other thing about episode one is that it had the potential to have really cool villains, right? So we don't have Darth Vader anymore, uh, We but we need a villain. And we got Darth Maul. That's who we got as our... Are scary. How do you feel about Darth Maul? Villain. He's awesome. He's super cool. He looks badass. He's menacing. He has the double bladed lightsaber, which that when was he really cool. when he Gosh. turned that on, when he lit the one end and then he lit the other end, it was like oh, it was so <laughs> cool. And the choreography for the lightsaber fight in the climax was so good. It was it was flashy and a spectacle, but but it also like. I don't, it was just skillful. You could tell that the actors doing it were skilled, and it made you feel like, oh, these aren't nobody. You know, this isn't Luke who's never been trained, and this isn't Darth Vader who has robot arms and legs. These are Jedi and Sith who have been trained to fight with a lightsaber, and they have skill, and they're flipping around and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So it made it feel really cool. There's a little bit of impracticality to all of their flailing around, but it was forgivable given the given how cool it all looked. Um, <laughs> And Duel of the Fates, the uh, the theme, the song that plays during that fight is one of the best, uh, the best tracks in all of Star Wars, um, as well. So that all of that was really really cool. Darth Darth Maul was awesome, and it's such a shame. It's just a damn shame he didn't get much screen time in the movie, and then he just died at the end of the yeah, movie. Like just a one and movie thing. One, like one movie one thing, off. and like he could have been carried on through episode two and three but he, he didn't now i will say technically outside of the movies he didn't he didn't actually die there he somehow survived got robot legs or something and came back in some spinoff stuff which i think is stupid um but but whatever like in the mandalorian you're saying 
not in the Mandalorian and other other stuff like some of the animated stuff. And actually, he oh, does okay. show up. He does show up in the Solo movie, uh, which is one of my gripes with the Solo movie. Uh, oh, but wow. it's just it's a shame um, that Darth Maul wasn't. Uh, wasn't utilized more effectively because he was really really freaking cool and i always go to like if you kill a character they better be dead i hate say like telling explicitly this character's dead and then just finding a potion or you know just being alive later i'm really sick of that i I find that to be an unforgivable thing to do you're not Mm -hmm. allowed to do that and and have my respect at the same time like as a storyteller if you you can you can make us think someone's dead, and but obviously, I, like if it just cuts away. But if you've explicitly like had a funeral or have them like fall off the cliff, like from really really high up or whatever, like if you've told us very explicitly the person's dead, like screw you if you do anything different with that. Like I, yeah. I don't respect it. I totally agree. So yeah, episode one it has some uh, some meaningful drawbacks. Like technically there. There's just too much CGI. Some of it looks really good on the ships and some of the settings. It looks good, but on the characters, it's not quite there. And the, what I mentioned about giving too much creative freedom, I think it, it struggles with that a little bit. Um, and then there's one other thing that it bugs a lot of Star Wars fans, and I admit it kind of kind of bugs me a little bit too. There's a scene where um, Qui-Gon measures Anakin's blood, and he determines that he has such a high count of midichlorians, which we've never heard that word before, and he explains that midichlorians are this symbiont that lives inside your bloodstream that grants force sensitivity to people. And so force apparently... Force sensitivity? Yeah, the ability to use the force. Yeah. And so apparently, according to this little bit of lore, the force isn't a mystical energy field that people gain aptitude for and you know have to kind of spiritually learn how to interact with which is cool which is cool cool. and what what yoda said instead it's some little parasites or cells that live inside you and you know you you interact with them in order to use the force which is super lame like that's just that's horrible we did we did not need that explanation the the point of the force is that it's a mysterious power that you have to understand yourself and become at one with the world with in order to use it and this takes the magic away from it so bad move bad move by george lucas there trying to explain the force so yeah um is it ever referenced again in all of star wars no i don't think i want to pretend it didn't happen they might i can't they might touch on it in episode two when they're talking about training anakin but i don't think so i think it's only in episode one that they mention it thankfully um, at least uh, in episode one, it does drop the themes. You know, it, it, it sprinkles in the themes that it's going to touch on for the rest of the prequels. Destiny, um, corruption of bureaucracy. Uh, it even has some kind of wholesome uh, nods to how to be a good mother, uh, Anakin's mother. Uh, they, they actually have some lines that stand out in the movie talking about how a mom should behave and how a son should behave to to a mom which is wholesome and and nice for a little thematic nod uh yeah so so it's fine episode one it's fine could be better could be a lot better um well, i'm ready to right. go to clone wars what does it get it's attack of the clones um, oh, excuse me attack Cl- of the clone. clone wars is, a, is actually a star wars movie but it's an animated cgi movie um that i did not i did not rewatch that movie Attack of the Clones got a four out of ten, so worse, uh, worse the than worst one yet. Yeah. the worst one yet. Yeah, it's certainly worse than Episode One. Um, so I guess the takeaway here is that it's not as pointless. Um, like the development that we see on Anakin is actually important here, particularly with his uh, revenge. You know, he starts to um, evoke some darkness uh, when his mom. Uh, you know, gets threatened. Um, it, it's pretty good, uh, and it moves things along with uh, with him and Padme a bit. So that's good. It gives us a little bit of a sense of his his relationship with Obi Wan, which is good. And there's a lot more world building. The world building in Episode Two is actually just as good or better than in Episode One. So that's great. But the the 
Oh, and also another really important thing is the time skip. You know, it jumps ahead from him being nine years old to him being whatever, 18 years old. You know, he's a young adult. And that was a good move. I think that they should have actually started started here. Um, with him being a young, a young adult and then done maybe flashbacks to how he was discovered or something. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the worst part, the worst part of episode two is the acting. Uh, it is horrible. It's so bad. Like, no one improves. Padme stays the same. She's just as bad. Anakin, Hayden Christensen as Anakin, is so wooden. Like, man. And he's so cringy. Like, a lot of the movies, since he's trying to fall in love with Padme, is him flirting with Padme. And it, it means there's some of the worst dialogue in all of Star Wars in this movie. <laughs> like, you've probably is seen... George Lucas is writing, I mean, explicitly. It's got to be. Just, I mean, yeah. It's. I mean, I think it's Lucas just, yeah, not being able to write uh, romance <laughs> very well, and and I don't know. His character direction is so bad. I mean, maybe with good actors doing a good job, they could have pulled it off. But I mean, you've probably seen that one line where he's like talking about, uh, "I hate sand." Anakin's saying he's standing next to Padme and saying, "I hate sand. It's rough and coarse." It gets everywhere, and he's like rubbing her arm and saying, "Oh, but it's soft here. Everything is soft. It's horrible. <laughs> it's so bad. It makes you cringe just watching it." Um, I have seen that meme. Like it, it, that is hard to believe that that made the cut on a, on a for a blockbuster film. Yeah, you know. I, I mean, like, all right. So I'll, I'll I'll insert this here, but like there are really campy parts of the prequels like that that have become memes because they are bad but but they're also still really fun like the the sand thing is really funny and you know pod racing oh, i uh, i can spin that's a good trick like all of these things that are really corny and probably not good to include in your movies have become funny in the same There's way that something we en- joyful about it is what you're saying there's still joy you there know, yeah in the same way that we enjoy things from like Big Trouble in Little China and some of our other B movies that are campy but fun even though they there's something not quite right about them but the prequels managed to remain enjoyable even with some of those bad parts um, and I'll be interested to see over the next 20 years whether the sequels have anything redemptive like that because the prequels certainly have bad parts but those bad parts have become fun in a way I just don't know if the sequels are going to be able to to do that as well. Right, because I don't, if I'm recalling, I mean, the acting isn't bad in those. They're sufficient. No, uh, the acting is know. fine in the sequels. The character no, direction just, is fine. No, no, I just mean, like, in general, the sequels, like, the acting's too good. Like, part of your saying is not just the line, deli- but the delivery, too. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, so, yeah, it's unlikely without, anyway, yeah. I just don't think you're. I think you're right that like the the sequels will, don't have redemptive qualities in the future, like or it won't age uh, with charm. Like you're 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 kind of making the case that some of these bad lines and, and stiff acting can can be. There's some degree of charm in that, or some joy yes. in that. Yeah. Yes, a, a little bit. Now, would I rather it be on just good <laughs> yeah, yeah. just good and also charming like like episode five yes i would rather it be like that but at least it maintains some soul it's soul it's about the soul and yeah. episode two has soul it has some soul in it there's some cool scenes um there's a scene where um you meet boba fett and and his father jango fett uh boba fett's a clone and obi-wan fights jango fett in the rain on a landing pad that's a cool fight scene uh, it's really neat um, you get introduced to Count Dooku uh, in the movie. He's the villain of this movie, and it's a shame. The same way with Darth Maul, it's a shame that Count Dooku is wasted. He has really little screen time. He doesn't die at the end of this movie, but he dies at the very beginning of the next movie. And so, like, I don't know. Villain-wise, it was just kind of grasping a lot of the time. The Emperor was always behind the scenes, but he didn't really become an overt villain until the third until episode three so i felt like all three movies were scrounging for a villain and it would have been much better if for example darth maul was the primary visible villain that kept challenging anakin um but that sadly wasn't the case 
I'm I'm eager to talk about the the sequels, but I don't want to walk past the third one. So can we jump to the third one? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's really all all to say about episode two. Um, so Re- Revenge of the Sith uh, episode three, I gave it eight out of ten. I, I think it's better than Return of the Jedi. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm conflicted. I think they're it's very close in quality to Return of the Jedi. If Return of the Jedi is a seven, it's a good seven, and if uh, Revenge of the Sith is an eight. It's you know it, it's just barely making it to an eight. Yeah. Um, but finally, finally in this movie, it, the prequels actually start to feel justified a little bit. Um, so something fact, changed. I never saw the third one. <laughs> what? You should watch it. It's a good yeah. movie. Like it's actually enjoyable. You should re- you should just rewatch the prequels sometime. Yeah, I really um, should. But it's it's actually good. Um, Something changed. I don't know whether they get hired a new character director or something, but the acting gets better. Uh, it takes a step up. It's not great. It's still not Oscar level or anything, but Anakin does better. Obi-Wan does better. Padme does better. Everyone does better. In it's acting. like everyone had been giving them feedback. This is stilted. This is stilted. And they listen to some degree is what yes. you're saying. Yep. And so that, that really changes the way the movie feels. In addition to that, it's a darker movie because it's it's the movie in which Anakin actually does go bad. It's also PG- lava is my memory of like yeah, just there's lava, yeah, which is scary. Um, it's lava PG- like dark. It's like nighttime lava. <laughs> yeah, it's a PG thirteen movie, so it actually jumps out of the PG car- uh, category, and so it's a, a, a little bit darker. Um, is that for the first time? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, but the movie has a lot of cool stuff. It has one of the best space battles, uh, one of the best opening scenes in Star Wars, maybe the best opening scene with a cool space battle. Um, it has a, an, a scene where you may have, if you haven't seen it, you haven't seen this scene, but Order 66, which is the Emperor's order to kill all the Jedi when he finally reveals himself. And there's a scene where all these Jedi are on different planets and the clone troopers betray them suddenly. And it's a really good it's a good scene. I mean, it's sad, but like it's well done. It's it's a moving scene, yeah. um, and the last, the whole last half of the movie is climax essentially. And there's this epic lightsaber fight between Anakin and Obi Wan, and the choreography is really good. And they're just they're on the lava planet and they're going all over the place. It's kind of extreme. It's like some people might think it's over the top, but I don't know. It's just too cool. Um, their confrontation is really good. Uh, the actors do a good job, I think, and it does a. I, I think it ties all of the plot points together really nicely. It sets up for the classic trilogy as well as you could expect. There are only a few tiny little gaps in things about Padme and Luke and Leia being born that are kind of like, really? Is that how it is? But overall, it, I think it does an excellent job. Um, I mean, honestly, with it ge- being an eight, it, it's, it nearly redeems, you know, I mean, Episode one and two are collectively a nine, so it it surpassed yeah. them, uh, you know, or, or I think or that's just underneath yeah. them. Yeah. I think that's right. I think that's about right. Um, it's not perfect. It has a couple problems, like the villain thing that I mentioned is still a problem. Uh, they they introduce a character called General Grievous, who is like a he's a droid. Well, he he's got organic parts. Somehow his body was destroyed, so he's got these organs embedded in a droid body, um, which is kind of an interesting idea and he's cool looking but he's totally cgi which kind of puts a damper on it yeah i love puppets or whatever you want or animatronics or whatever you want to call it i just love Mm -hmm. the physical creations me too you know i just think there's charm in that and uh, you know we want that i want that as a moviegoer i wish that were a trend you know away from cgi yeah me too and they in the sequels to their credit they did do a lot of practical effects um that's one of my scant pieces of praise for the sequels um but yeah episode three uh they do a good job with the plot and everything a couple of gripes here and there but overall it's a solid movie it's actually quite good so the original gets a score of what what was it 26 this gets a score of 17 uh you know out of 30 so So struggles but you know makes it over the halfway mark so yep all right so next on my list i've got rogue one um so Rogue One is a, the first standalone Disney movie. Yes. Uh, and I gave it a 6 out of 10. Uh, okay. I enjoyed Rogue One, 
but I can't get over how weird it is. It doesn't feel like a Star Wars movie. It doesn't feel like it fits exactly. And I also had, I have some bias still lingering because when I heard that they were making a Star Wars movie called Rogue One, I immediately thought, excellent, this is going to be about X-Wings. This is going to be, because there's a Rogue Squadron is a team of X-Wings um, uh, that shows up in the classic trilogy. And I was like, amazing, this is going to be a essentially Top Gun Star Wars. Um, and sadly, it was not. There's a really good like book a series. War movie. I've only seen it once in theaters, but if I recall, it was like a tragic war movie. And yes. really heavy. And it, it was well yeah. done. So. It was well done. Yeah, it was well made. They respected the lore for the most part. There was a lot of the sound effects were spot on. Um, all of the uh, aesthetics were good, like the, the way the planets looked, and they had some ATATs and the lasers and the blasters and everything. All of that was fantastic. So they did a great job with that. If all of the Disney stuff was like Rogue One, then you know I wouldn't I wouldn't hate it so much. Um, but sadly, Rogue One is relatively unique in that respect. Um, so yeah, uh, strengths of Rogue One are definitely in the design, uh, the sound, it's more technical stuff. Um, the the visual design, the cinematography, and the sound. They could, those they are, could also those are... create it with a fearlessness. It's a one-off. They don't need to build. They like they, they you know the ending's gonna how it's gonna play out, and it's a darker movie. So they had a lot of leeway to, I think, just be bold and tell the mm -hmm. story without having to please everyone for the next movie yeah you know? and they did they did that they were bold they took a chance and i can respect them trying to make a war a war movie in star wars like that's how the spinoff should be they should be a little experimental and you know tell things within the universe um instead of trying to push the universe forward in a way and and i think they did they did that um one other strength of rogue one is their the ensemble cast it's both a strength and a weakness like the all of the characters were cool taken you know as an individual they were cool you had the blind monk guy um who was the martial artist dude uh and he could kind of use the force or something he was really cool you had the like big chunky dude with the super blaster he was kind of cool you had the assassin droid I actually didn't like the droid very much um you had the kind of skeevy uh infiltrator spy rebel guy you had um farce whitaker asthmatic farce whitaker breathing in his mask <laughs> thing everyone was visually unique it felt like you know someone was playing a star wars rpg and everyone had their own custom character and they decided to make a movie with them and so all of that was really good the problem was that because they had so many cool characters none of them got appropriate screen time um and you only got to see a little bit of all of them. Unfortunately, the person you got to see the most of was the protagonist, the girl, Jen, and she was the most boring of everyone. Like she was I totally I don't even remember her. That's she was totally it. forgettable and uninteresting and like she wasn't very sympathetic. Like I didn't care about her. I didn't like her. I didn't like it. I like I wanted to hear more about the other characters. I thought she was a waste of character. Um, and then another very Bennett like gripe is that there were a lot of accents in this movie. I had a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time understanding what they were saying. A lot of times, like that's funny. One guy had like a, a French accent or something, and I was like, <laughs> "Gosh, I can't understand this crap." Um. All right, Han Solo, or Solo, uh, excuse me. So Solo, three out of ten. I did not like it. Three. Um, I've not seen it. Three out of ten. It was bad. There's no need to watch it unless you just want to. I don't know, punish yourself. I mean, so, the idea of trying to replace Harrison Ford with a younger... Like, yeah, they totally failed. Cringy, you know? They totally failed. That was that was No the one's main talked reason. about it. It just kind of went away. People just pretended it didn't happen, I feel like. Yeah, well, that's because it was a pointless movie. Like, there was... It totally lacks charm. The guy who they recast um as han solo didn't look like han solo didn't act like han solo and, <laughs> like it's a failure <laughs> it was totally a failure now what i heard i don't know if this is true but what i read is that they wanted to make this a trilogy they wanted to make a han solo trilogy spinoff 
and they wanted to have him become Han Solo, essentially. And so he would start off in this movie not feeling exactly like Han Solo, but then becoming that way. If that's true, it was stupid, and they succeeded in making him not feel like Han Solo, and that ruined the movie. Um, and then they're so, not going to... If they scrap those plans, then... I, I mean, yeah, obviously, I, it's I been a while, so. so... Yeah, I think the movie did poorly at the box office. I think it was a loss, actually, overall, if I remember right. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff I could complain about here that I won't... Since you haven't seen it, I won't get into the, the details, but one one thing is an aesthetic thing which is the movie was ugly uh it, it felt like it had a brown filter a, like a foggy brown filter over every scene in the movie which Why? made it feel grimy and industrial and not visually appealing i don't understand why they made this decision there were some settings at the beginning of the movie that maybe they intended to evoke that feel, but for some reason they persisted and the whole movie felt that way and it was no good. Um, they also gave Han a love interest that wasn't Leia because he hadn't met Leia yet, of course, and she sucked. She was a bat. It's the same actress that played um, Daenerys in uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. And she's, whoever that is, I forget her name, she's just a bad actress. She was so flat, and, like, her and Han had no chemistry, and, like, they get separated. It's a plot point. They get separated towards the beginning of the movie, and he's trying to hook back up with her. And the whole time, I was like, why? Don't, just don't. She's boring, and she's not, <laughs> not interesting. I don't want her to come back in the movie. I want Han to go on adventures with Chewie. Um, and How was Chewie? Was he fun? Chewie was probably the best character in the movie, um, but the introduction of Chewie I, I didn't think was that great. Uh, there was a scene where Han gets kind of like captured by some bad guys, and he gets thrown into a pit, and Chewie's already there, um, captured, and Han and Chewie kind of buddy up to escape this pit together, which is fine. It just it was brown and muddy and gray and not visually interesting, and... I don't know. I didn't feel like Chewie and Han had good chemistry in this movie like they did in the classic movies. So I wasn't a fan. Um, what else to say about Han Solo? Uh, I mentioned, I alluded earlier to they, uh, they dropped Darth Maul in, and it was really out of left field. It was totally... Uh, uh, there was no reason to have Darth Maul show up. Like Apparently Darth Maul was kind of the behind-the-scenes guy orchestrating the baddies in this movie. And he shows up in hologram form. And it's totally disorienting because he died in episode one. And if you're just watching the Star Wars movies, you have no idea he's alive. And then, right. of course, they don't do anything with him. After after this movie ends, they don't do anything with Darth Maul again. So he just kind of shows up from the dead to, have a, to play a part and then never show up again. And it's just terribly done. Really badly done. <laughs> um, one, uh, let's see. If I could pay the movie a compliment, um, Lando. Lando shows up in this movie, and he's played by, I forget the actor's name. He's that, uh, I think he's like Denzel Washington's son. He, he's like a musician too, right? That okay. guy. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. He plays yeah. Lando, and he actually does a good job. He captures Lando's mannerisms uh, and voice pretty well. So he, he does a good job, but the plot that they involve him in is not very good. Also, um, this movie contains perhaps the most off-putting character in all of Star Wars, more than Jar Jar Binks, more than anyone from the sequels. It's Lando's droid. He has a droid who is like a sassy woman personality droid who like, is totally CGI and has stupid lines and stupid parts in the movie, and I hated it, and I wanted the droid to get <laughs> blown up almost immediately. It was horrendous, and whoever whoever included that droid and wrote that droid needs to be fired. <laughs> and when I say fired, I mean fired into the sun. Um, <laughs> God, it was awful. Oh man. So, so yeah, that's that's Han Solo. And thematically, uh, I'll I'll mention the themes since the themes are important. Yeah, what is the theme? What is the overarching moral? So. They are very Han Solo-ish themes, which I think are actually appropriate, like to expect betrayal, uh, rely on luck, and that even outlaws can be good guys. Those are kind of the main themes. And so they fit with Han's character. So for that, they at least succeeded in giving good 
good Han Solo related themes. Sure. But like a three, you said you gave it a three out of 10. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, three out of 10. It was bad. Yeah. I don't want to watch it again. Just, yeah, you'll just never watch it again. The, the pacing was bad. It was rushed. It, there, there are tons of other gripes that I wrote down that I won't, I won't bore you with. But yeah, it had many problems. It was well, bad. I'm eager. I'm eager to move on to the, to the, the sequels and get your take. <laughs> All right, episode seven, The Force Awakens. Yeah, I'm curious wanna, if it gets above a four or below. You know, what do you think? What do you think? I actually think you're gonna give it a four because I think like it's not that it's a horrible movie. Maybe, maybe even a five because it's not a horrible movie. It's just devoid of soul and like. So maybe that gets it. It depends. On, I mean, it is nostalgia bait and vapid, so that is bad. Uh, but the acting's good, the quality's good. The, the, some of the things I feel. Uh, I mean, it's eye candy. It's like so. I'm gonna stick with a four. I think you gave it a four. What'd you give it? I gave it a one. Okay, um, let's hear. <laughs> it is a soulless, copy pasted cash grab that injects modern sensibilities into Star Wars and spits oh, on... Oh, yeah, thematically it really does. It yeah. spits on the whole series legacy. It doesn't explain its own setting. It's made for ADHD generation. It's got a new set of heroes to replace the old set of heroes who yeah, are just constantly replace, disrespected. Too, which is not respectful, you know? <laughs> like... if, if, if I did not know what happened with episode 8 and 9, and I only watched episode 7 then I I wouldn't give up yet. And in fact, when I saw episode seven, I didn't give up yet. I thought, okay, it's going to be hard, but maybe this can be salvaged. But they totally and utterly failed. Um, and so, God, it's a disaster. Every I've watched The Force Awakens uh, three times now, and every time it gets worse, and I don't want to watch it again because <laughs> I, you can't go much lower than a one. Um, so, oh, all right, so... One of the most basic things that a sequel has to do is, especially a sequel with such a, a big chronological gap between the prior movie and it, is it's the duty of the movie to explain to you what happened in the intervening years, at least a little. Yes. It has to catch yes. you up. It has to tell you who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and why. And this movie fundamentally fails in that aspect. You do not know... Who the hell the First Order is, they're just, they seem to be just a copy-paste of the Empire. And in effect, that's what they are, although they shouldn't be. And you don't know why the people who won at the end of Episode 6, the, the you know, Luke and Leia and Han and the Rebels, like presumably they made a new government and were the good guys and the galaxy had peace. And yet, when we start watching Episode 7... They're the underdogs again. They're the they're called the resistance, not the aka not the rebellion. They're just the resistance, and they're fighting the first order, aka not the empire. And it's the same thing with no explanation, and they never explain how this came to be. It's like it's mind boggling. <laughs> Inexcusable for storytelling, like totally. regardless of your politics, regardless of your. Oh, of, it's just of, a story writing failure. You cannot do that. Like, would you you, how do you even a failure for like that's a strange failure? Like, it's a head scratcher. Even if you were to say all the soulless cash grab, all the you know uh, thematic poo pooing of of the entire thing. But this one is a li even more of a head scratcher because you can see the motivation behind cash grabbing. You can see the sure. political motiva motivations behind dumping on the the you know a big screw you to the the old right, fans right. like you can see motivations but this is a faux pas this is a like is that fair to yeah. say this is just wrong Dude, this is just wrong like, it's totally yeah. messed up like they could have put a five minute like history lesson in there you know wedged into the movie with them teaching ray what happened in the galaxy or something they could have done anything to try to fill in the gaps but they did not and gosh it is so disorienting and it's disconnecting. Like, everyone has a connection to certainly the classic trilogy and to a lesser degree the prequels. And they just did not capitalize on that connection in terms of story. They tried to capitalize it in terms of making a template that followed the same beats and cheap nostalgia, yeah. like including the Millennium Falcon or including some sound effects or something. But that's the extent of it they totally failed in the world building aspect which was in my opinion the best part of um certainly the prequels and also a very very big strength of the classic ones as well um 
an, another yeah. fundamental flaw of this movie is that they just had another Death Star, except this <laughs> time it was a big Death Star that could shoot five lasers and blow up five planets at once instead of just one. And how did they defeat this big Death Star? By having little starships go shoot a little bit of it and blow it all up. Like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this was the big, bad, scary <laughs> plot that they decided to inject into the movie. And, like, this, I'm not even complaining about the characters yet. And there's a lot to complain about. Like, the setup of the movie was flawed from the start. I do not understand. Was this just laziness? What do you, what do you think... Or do you just think that, like, they said, look, audiences are fairly forgetful. They want the nostalgia. Just just, just repackage. Just repackage. It's safe. Like, people are going to, you know, just repackage it. Because I people don't... generally, like, right when it came out and everyone was running, rushing to the theater, they were satisfied, man. They walked out going, like, shouldn't this count for more than a one? Like, no. millions and millions of people are walk out of the movies going, ah, that was fun. Like, no. so clearly it's not boring. Uh, it's not... Uh, like it was just no, it was no good people, fun. people, no people were excited to have another Star Wars movie. That's what that's what all the excitement was about. It wasn't because it was a good movie because it wasn't. It was a terrible movie. It wasn't because it was fun and fulfilling and thematically satisfying or anything like that. It wasn't because the characters were good. It was because more Star Wars. I love Star Wars, and here's another Star Wars. And I'm excited. I've been looking forward to it for months and finally i went and saw it and ah, oh, i saw it that was good a thing happened but then over time the more you watch it and the more you sit with the story and of course after the sequel the sequels come out you realize that it's a husk it's empty there's nothing actually there and I mean, you're right that it's time extremely is extremely disappointing you correctly that that it is not standing the test of time well people no. are going huh this was i think i think uh uh, South Park even did an episode on on that on how people liked it, but now they're realizing how crappy it is. Like that's how how big of a thing it is. Is that like Star Wars? I mean, excuse me, South Park does an episode about how we were all hoodwinked about it. Yeah, well, but it's I an really interesting. Enjoy that. <laughs> it's an interesting social phenomenon that you know that we can all love something and be excited and then quickly turn to dislike it. Uh that's interesting how that can happen. Yeah, and I think very. It was, I mean, over a course of a year, or or once people like sobered up from. Well, I it's think not like I, what you're saying that ah, I got to see a Star Wars movie yeah. for the first time. Well, in I, a while. I think you can draw like you can make a food analogy, which I know people hate food analogies, but like it's episode seven is like a like a sugary energy drink or something, or and, even going to a Michelin. St- like restaurant michelin star restaurant i'm super hungry i bite in and i'm immediately telling you it's the best thing i've ever eaten and then later when i'm full and maybe i have access for some reason to this meal as much as i want i take a bite and i go actually i don't know what i I was just saying it was good it really isn't that good well no it's actually if you go to a michelin star restaurant and you're served a monster energy drink and that's what you that's your meal (laughs) because you're in the fancy environment and you're you're going wow wow this monster poured in a nice glass poured in a yeah fancy glass wow this monster energy drink must be really delicious and you drink it and you convince yourself yeah wow i'm in a michelin star restaurant so this must be really good and then when you get home you crash and your blood sugar plummets and you realize that (laughs) there was no there was no nutrition at all there was no meat literally no meat and now you feel empty drained and less healthy than when you started and appropriately so (laughs) okay so is that semi- oh, but you haven't gotten into your gripe with the characters. I guess this is again you're you're establishing that some of these gripes probably continue throughout. Is this fair to, yes. to shortcut this? Is, well, is this the well, the emptiness, or do you actually think it tried to be substantive just in the wrong ways later on, or what? Um. Well, so yeah, yes, my gri- character gripes persist through the trilogy. Um, but the trilogy, the three movies are so disjointed that the complaints actually change a little bit movie to movie um just a little bit but what what i will say is is consistent is the disrespect for luke han and leia they're treated like total garbage um and i don't understand the desire to destroy heroes uh so luke doesn't even appear in episode seven until the last two minutes of the movie and he has he has no lines so it is absolutely and utterly unforgivable to not feature 
the main character of Star Wars in Star Wars, like, in this movie. Especially like, with his willingness to participate. Like, what the heck? It doesn't make yeah. any sense. Luke Skywalker, who is the hero, he's a prototypical hero. We watched him become a hero and or, and take responsibility for his actions and learn how to use the Force, and he was the good guy. And then what do we find when Episode Seven begins? He's a crotchety old man who... who uh, avoids responsibility. Avoids responsibility, runs away and becomes a hermit, and doesn't even show up in the movie. It's totally yeah. unforgivable. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, it does not follow. You're right. That does not follow. That is not Luke Skywalker in terms and, of staying consistent with character. It's just and, not. And this movie, Episode 7, doesn't even try to explain why. It doesn't. He just J.J. Abrams just kicks the can down the road and says, "I'll just leave. It's not my problem anymore. I'm not making episode eight. I'll just leave that for the next guy to explain." Which is totally unforgivable. Do you think you they can't didn't have a three story arc? They did, no. They they absolutely did not. They did not know what. I think that's confirmed. Actually, they didn't know what they were gonna do when they made when they finished that episode is seven. So messed up for storytelling. Like, oh, you, it's you, it's so messed up. Um, and also, you can you can give. I mean, you don't have to have all the dialogue written but you should have major plot points charted for a trilogy because you have three movies to tell a story how dare you just sort of draft the beginning with that knowing you can't go back and edit it like like gosh that is that's again that's another unforgivable storytelling thing that's just like that just says our goal is not to tell a story it's to get your butt to buy a ticket that's what our goal is yes this is not like we're creating star wars because we have a story to tell this is Disney sees an opportunity for money, and then that's it. Uh, and then you get in, like I guess, the politics of killing heroes. Like as disgusted as you are by it, and I am too, by the way. Like I, the motivation just seems to be like that sort of postmodern, like you know, being a good person, working hard, doesn't always get you what you want. You know, the world's yeah. unfair. Like it seems to be this sort of. I think it's a political underpinning of like screw the hero's journey that's a like whatever but perhaps like a racist concept or something well, you know it's a, a privileged it's, concept so. there's 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 twin there's twin themes that i don't think can go together but they do try to weave them together which is the one you just outlined which is you don't have to be you know heroes aren't really good people they're bad people and they they can stop being heroic at any moment and you know they can die and and shame and disrespect and then there's a parallel theme, which is also, you know, it's uh, it's around Ray, which is you can be a prodigy, good at everything, have zero flaws, have no character development, and be a hero, be the quote unquote hero, not a real hero, but you, the the universe can make you into a protagonist naturally without any effort, training, or hard work, and you can stay that way for the duration of your story, and it doesn't make sense, right? Like. That, that, like, I don't understand how you can contain both of those things. And, like, what are you trying to tell people when you it's say... The, the world is chaos and random. <laughs> like, that's what you're trying is, to say. Yeah, that the is world, most modern ideology, it is, is it yeah, The world is meaningless. If you work hard, you fail. If you don't do anything, you might be perfect and amazing. It just doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. I guess that's the theme. That's the theme yes. of the sequels. Like... Your agency, your individuality, your humanity is totally irrelevant. Who know, You're just in the grip of stuff, and you will die, suffer, or succeed on whim. And like, wow, what a terrible message. <laughs> yeah, well, what an uninspiring message if there's just, I mean, yeah. Uh, so there are so many other, there. I mean, the thematic problems are the most, um, the, the most important problems with with the movie but there are technical problems with the movie there are plot holes like I, I don't know if you remember this but the whole MacGuffin of the movie is find Luke like that's the thing find Luke and there's yes. this yes, there's this I do remember that there's this map piece they find a map segment and it shows the way to Luke Skywalker uh, and that's the thing that like um, the pilot Poe has and Ray eventually ends up with it and you see it and it's this little puzzle piece looking segment of a map and there's a bunch of stars and planets. It just got like an X on it. Oh, there's there's where Luke is. And then, and so they know the end point and for some reason that's not good enough. 
they, they have this giant section of the galaxy where Luke is, and they can't get to him yet. So somehow, even though they have that, they still don't know. And then later, much later in the movie, near the end, R2-D2 wakes up. For some reason, he was asleep. He wakes up, and he now has the big galaxy map. So he shows you the map of the whole galaxy, and there's this goofy puzzle piece-shaped chunk cut out of it. And they CGI you know, merge the chunk that we discovered earlier in the movie yeah, into yeah. this, and now the orange line connects. Oh, now we can get to Luke Skywalker. But that's stupid. Because, we, <laughs> because it, would be, it would be like saying Luke Skywalker, we discover Luke Skywalker is in Atlanta, and we have a map of Georgia, and we only have the map of Georgia. And, well, we know where Georgia is, so why don't we just go find Luke Skywalker because we know where Georgia is. Instead, right. we have to wait for R2-D2 to give us a map of the United States with a cutout of Georgia with nothing in there and go, oh, that's where Georgia is. Now we can get to Luke Skywalker in Atlanta now that we it's know It's just a that... logically dumb thing to write in, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. How did it make it into a movie? Like, this movie was millions and millions of dollars budget. How did this make it? It doesn't make sense. Surely someone said, wait, we're all idiots. Like, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't understand. Did this get a it. one, you said? <laughs> yeah, it gets a one. It gets a one, and if I watch it again, it'll probably get a point five. Um, <laughs> like, God, it's awful. Uh, another like, never uh, watch again awful, right? Like, you're probably never going to watch it again. Yes, now that, I've, now that I've watched it and taken notes, I don't, I don't have to again. Um, there's lots of other little things, but one, one other thing I'll mention is Han's, Han's death, because that's a... a you know that's it's actually the first death of one of the heroes and yes. his death is meaning is meaningless in this movie um they don't it could have been meaningful if they did something with kylo ren the uh, the bad guy if they yeah. made han's death meaningful but they didn't uh they didn't do any toying with kylo and his dark side light side journey nothing was thematically important it was just kind of there and so han's death was yeah, it was pointless. Right, I, I'm not against killing him, perhaps in the final movie or something like that, you know, with a meaningful moment. But no, yeah, you're right. It was sort of uh, haphazard and, and not respectful. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, the only other thing to comment on is Ray, who is the, you know, the protagonist of the sequel trilogy, is a Mary Sue. She can do everything. Um, I, I took notes of everything that she can do. She can understand droid speak. She can survive alone in the desert. She has professional climbing and scavenging skills. She can speak some other desert language. She can fly ships like an ace pilot, give Han tips on how to fly the Falcon. She can repair ships she's never flown before. She can resist force interrogation. She's a crack shot with a blaster. She has some mysterious connection to Luke Skywalker with visions and crap. She can use force persuasion without being trained, which is unacceptable. She can hack security systems on a foreign super weapon. She can use force telekinesis without training, which is unacceptable. She can fight a trained force user with a lightsaber when she's never even held one before. It's just totally ridiculous. Character. Just the, like she, super, the game genie like broke her. You yeah, know? <laughs> she has no development. Uh, There's nowhere I, to go with a character like that. No. Um, I, I will say that the best part in the entire sequel trilogy happens in episode 7. Uh, and you probably don't remember this because it's a really tiny bit, but C-3PO appears for the first time, and he, he has a red arm, and he says something like, you probably don't recognize me because of the red arm, and it's just, it's funny, it's a, I mean, it's a corny joke, it's a little throwaway <laughs> joke, but I liked it, I'm, it made me chuckle, and I actually thought they did a good job with C-3PO's humor in episode 7, uh... I don't that, remember that line, but yeah, that, that is a funny line. <laughs> and that's the best part of the whole movie. Everything else was garbage. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't like Finn. I didn't like Snoke, the bad guy who just appeared from nowhere for no reason. Uh, I didn't like anyone in the movie. I thought Kylo wasn't that great. Um, there was a part where Finn fought Kylo with a lightsaber. Finn's not a Jedi. How can he use a lightsaber and he even gets sliced up by Kylo's lightsaber and doesn't die. That's stupid. Lightsabers chop your limbs off. Like, it's totally ridiculous. So bad. Yeah. The score yeah. was underwhelming. It was no good. No good. Is that the Garbage. one where in space the phys they drop something in space, you know, a bomb? No, that, that's that episode one. eight. It gets worse. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready to go there? Yeah, let's go there.
All right, episode eight, my least favorite. If you gave this one a one, what did you give episode eight? A zero. It's a zero out of ten. It's, it's a the, zero. So not it's... only not only is Last Jedi the worst Star Wars movie, it's a contender for the worst movie of all <laughs> of all movies that I've ever seen. But that's because you like Star. Your well, respect for Star Wars is 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 so doing the, that. Is that the, right? Yes. The reason is because this movie is not only bad in and of itself it reaches its tentacles out and ruins other movies. So it's a negative influence on the movies surrounding it beca- and because it's so bad. Like, this is... I hate this movie. Like, <laughs> I, you know, people say they hate things, and the emotion of hate is actually pretty rare, but I hate this movie. Like, it is horrible. It is... It's subversive, disrespectful, idiotic... Thematically vapid, borderline immoral. It doesn't even mesh with borderline episode seven. Borderline immoral. I'd be curious about that. <laughs> it's terrible. It's trash. It's garbage. And I don't think it can be fixed. I don't think it's a problem that can be fixed. So, like, essentially. But there's some white sand and they, like, trace in oh, red lines and it looks cool. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That was cool, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, they, also <laughs> save, they also save some animals. They save some cute animals and, and tore down the greedy capitalist gamblers. So that was cool. That made, yeah. me, feel, that made me feel good. <laughs> that, that, the greedy capitalist people, that, that place, that setting was neat for a moment. Very like Star Warsy to take us to a, a neat, weird place for a second. That was cool. No, it wasn't. It was creatively vapid because it was just a copy paste of las vegas like they didn't even have the good graces to include star warsy gambling options there were roulette tables there like it was <laughs> badly designed it was badly designed pointless were they to hover the plot. roulette tables maybe i don't I, remember I don't, I don't even think they were hovering so <laughs> fail on failure on all counts god the, as you mentioned this was the movie that in the opening scene there's a space battle which at least that's good there's uh there's a space battle but they fight um there's a bunch of fighters that uh go fight this big scary super it's not a super star destroyer it's just some new star destroyer and they're bombers and they're in space mind you and these bombers apparently drop bombs using gravity they're gravity bombs like old yeah, world they war fall. 2 planes they fall. and, they and in fall. fact the whole scene is built on the tension of gravity right yes. like someone's down there and it's someone's down at the fall. bottom they fell and the uh, they have to like knock the little detonator thing down the ladder shaft it's so stupid cuz they're in space and do why people wings... talk about this is this widely referenced is how dumb this is like in no. space dumb no bombs because the dropping? rest the the rest of the movie is so utter garbage that people forget about this that happened at the beginning of the, like this is trivial compared to the the rest of the garbage movie but um <laughs> like it doesn't make sense because y wings we saw y wings in episode four in the very first star wars movie they were the bombers they have torpedoes and bombs and they're old at the time of this movie they're ancient and yet they could do so much better than these crappy gravity bomb dropping pieces of yeah. crap like <laughs> You're so mad. <laughs> it's so stupid. Like it, these are these are rookie mistakes. Like this this is rookie stuff. Like this is utter disrespect for the world of Star Wars and like people not using their brains. Like use your brain and think about what would you if think technology be was sole advanced. Your job is to ju- just just some sort of. I mean, isn't there like someone? There's, their job is to make sure their costume. If you have their sleeve rolled yeah. up in one scene, it needs to yeah, be yeah. rolled Continuity. up. Or if holding a cam- yeah, yeah. What's it called? Continuity. Yeah, a continuity person. So can't we just have a role? If you have all these roles, like one should just be like a logic, a, a logistics. Well, it's yeah. not just logic. It's just like this isn't logically unfolding in a way that makes sense. Like, the, or if the if the solution like like just like the map issue in the last movie, it's just like these things. Is there just someone to to check it and go? No, don't don't do that. There's not gra- there, There's gra- There's no gravity in space. Like. Like, come on. I, I don't understand how they... I, 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 <laughs> that, that is unforgivable. Like, that's yes. just unforgivable. Well, there, it gets even more unforgivable. Like, there's another scene where Leia... You know, this is late, a little later in the movie, and um, the ship that Leia's on gets blown up. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. And, like, someone shoots into their... Um, yeah, she's floating out there about to die, yeah. right? Well, well yeah. there's a scene where they fire into the window or whatever, and you see this m- giant fireball... And it 
overtakes Leia and Leia fl like flies into the camera and it's like, oh crap, Leia just got killed. The fireball overtakes Leia. You see the fire like, devour her. And yes. like it's clear if she experienced that, she's a goner. And then we get some more movie, and then we get her body floating in space. Somehow she's not destroyed and blown to bits from the fireball and the blast wave. Or even burned, right? I don't think Yeah, she's or burned. even burned or nothing. She's just floating in the void of space. Space, mind you, vacuum where you can't breathe and your mucous membranes explode and your eyes, you know, the pressure like boils your blood and everything. Like yeah. she's a goner. She's out there for longer than a minute, and somehow she exhibits force powers that she's never exhibited before and she space which is herself like harry potter over to the door somehow gets in and then of course when they open the door what would happen is all the air would blow out and blow her out into space and suck all the people out the door as well but of course that doesn't happen they just kind of grab her and pull her into the hallway <laughs> and then she recovers and she's back within the movie it's you, stupid you mentioned harry potter do you think people writing these scenes have sort of a dis like they're just kind of they treat Harry Potter, all this, like, it's just all nonsense. And then they come in and they go, well, since we're working in, like, would they hear your criticisms and they're like, look, we're writers and, like, th this is this is basically Harry Potter. And, like, they, so they just they kind of call it all, like, uh, this is fantasy, okay? Like, chill out, Bennett. Like, like we just, like, you suspend your disbelief for movies and we're yeah. just going to write some stuff. Like I it, think, it, I, I mean, that's what they had to have done, but that's not what you do. When you of course, spend, it's not what you do. I just when, think that's you, the irreverent attitude they're bringing to it. Yes. It's like, look, look, it's a movie. Like, we got to get her back in, and we want some suspense, and it's a compelling visual of her, like, about to die. The, the audience is going to go, oh, is she going to make it? And then, like, we answer that question. You're, you're getting all concerned with, like, logic and stuff. Yeah, uh, well, you don't you don't buy Star Wars from Lucas for billion, literally billions of dollars and then treat it casually, like... That's not what makes Star yeah. Wars good. Like, you're totally wasting all of the potential, and that's what they did. They totally wasted it. And in this movie in particular, they didn't just waste it. They screwed it. They, like, shot a big fat bird to anyone who cared about it. Like, I think Ryan Johnson, I don't know what his deal is, but, like, there's something dark in him that he wanted to, he wanted, he wanted to disrespect people who liked the classic trilogy. He saw the themes and the wholesomeness and the classic nature and the hero's journey and all that stuff. And he wanted to say, no, I disagree. And I'm going to dismantle all of those things. And that's what he did in this movie. I, in, I in multiple agree ways. <laughs> I really think that's what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, there are uh, the, the casino thing is awful. I already mentioned the, the main gimmick of this movie is f like episode five. And this is another template sort of thing. It's a space chase. They're fleeing. The uh, The bad guys are chasing the good guys through space. For some reason, it's the first time in all of Star Wars that they're running out of gas. They don't have enough fuel uh, for, for whatever reason. That's never been a problem before. But they're running out of gas, and they can't just jump to hyperspace too much. They're being tracked for some reason. This doesn't make any sense because the bad guys could just, who are not fuel limited, could just jump in front of them, jump all around them. They have a ton of ships and a ton of fuel. They could just catch them whenever they want, but for, for plot reasons that, that are never explained, they don't do this. And then, like, you probably remember this too, this is one of the most popular complaints about the movie. In the climax of the movie, um, the way that they the uh, the good guys get away is the really horrendous purple-haired feminist admiral woman that takes over stupidly uh -huh. and is extremely dislikable she turns into a hero all of a sudden because she has the idea to light speed jump her ship into the bad guys and blow up all the bad guy yeah. ships by, yeah. <laughs> by going to hyperspace and jumping into suicide bombing um all of the ships now this ruins all of star wars because if you can do this if you can just light speed jump into ships and blow them up why haven't they done this before? Like, why didn't yeah. Why didn't the rebels just light speed jump a ship into the Death Star and blow it up? Like, you can't you can't do this. Why didn't the Empire this in this movie the Empire fleet chasing or the the First Order fleet chasing the good guys? <clears throat> why didn't they just light speed jump one of their ships? They have a ton of ships. They don't care about people. Their people. Why didn't they just light speed jump one of their guys into? the the resistance people and blow them all up in fact why don't you just get a droid to pilot suicide bomber ships none of it makes sense 
there's no explanation for why this is possible and why no one has tried this before and it is just stupid it's stupid the scene the actual visual scene looks cool like when it, when it happens there's yeah, like a, sil- yeah. a silhouette of the ships and it looks cool but looking cool isn't good enough it's not good enough um <clears throat> there's another scene uh near the climax where they introduce this um character rose the the asian girl and she's one of the worst characters in star wars she's totally pointless uh, she has no yeah what is her what is her, what does she exist in she, she has no do? role in the story she's just just a person that's there and <laughs> Um, there's this scene on the planet with the white, the salty uh, surface that you mentioned, and the red underneath it, where they have these dilapidated little ships, and they have to go out and fight the big scary uh, bad guys who have landed. It's very reminiscent of Episode Five, um, and Finn, uh, who he he is going to essentially suicide bomb this big cannon that threatens all of the good guys, and so he it's very dramatic, and he's rushing to crash himself into this cannon and take it out before it can shoot everyone and here comes asian girl out of nowhere and rams her little ramshackle ship into him to save his life Uh, this probably should have killed both of them by the way oh yeah i hated this scene and she suicide bombs him so that he doesn't suicide bomb the cannon they're on the same team mind you and she apparently does this because she cares about him and doesn't want him to die or whatever and like typical Asian driver, am I right? And <laughs> like, she totally ruins his his moment of heroism. And and then of course the cannon fires and blows up the door, and you know things go south. Like it was total subversion of a heroic action. And I don't I don't understand. Like, I don't get it. It was a bad scene, a bad character. <sighs> All right. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. And and then uh gosh, I have pages, but I'll skip to I'll skip to the worst, the worst of it. So Luke. This is where Luke comes back into the series and he's pathetic. He says, you know, he came to this island to die. Uh like he, he apparently he came to the island to die cuz he considered murdering Kylo Ren when Kylo Ren was starting to turn to the dark side. Which totally conflicts with Luke's character because Luke, you know, he he redeemed Darth Vader, who was evil and did lots of bad things, and he put a lot of energy into turning Darth Vader back to the good side. And yet Kylo, who was not turned to the dark side, he was just conflicted. He walks into his tent and ignites his lightsaber and is about to like murder him in his sleep. Like that is right. not something no. Luke Skywalker would do. And no, I hated that. I hated that. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. And then, like, after much toil, he grumpily decides to actually play some part. But for whatever reason, he doesn't actually play a physical real part. Instead, we get magical force projection. Which, what is that? Has that ever been That's ever? never been done before, ever. And apparently, it's he's sitting on a rock, you know, light years away in a totally different planetary system. And he projects himself into the climax you know with the, the the white salt and stuff and kylo ren is there and they have a fight but luke isn't really there he's just a force projection and then and so you think okay well i guess this is a new force power or whatever and luke is actually going to you know and now that he's bought time and the good guys have escaped and he's distracted kylo ren for long enough he'll disappear and then in the next movie we'll see luke come back and be a badass and actually take over things Nope. No. Nope. As soon as soon as his astral projection is done, Luke Skywalker just keels over and dies. He just Which, keels over and dies. He, he kind of vanishes, ke- right? They like, just dissipate. Like this well, yeah, that's what happens. You know, that's what happened to Yoda when he died, and Obi Wan okay. when he died. You know, you you. Okay, so there's some consistency. So there's some consistency there, but the fact that he died from no wound, he's the strongest Jedi. You know, alive. He's this oh, epic yeah. figure, and he no just, wound. Why? Why did he die? If there, it just exhausted him. Exa- he was just tired. Projection. He was just tired. Uh, yeah. It was so bad. It was offensive. When I was watching this movie for the first time in theaters, I was instantly offended. I probably said something out loud, and like, 
It is. And did you wonder? Did I build this moment up in my head? Maybe it makes more sense upon a rewatch. And no, you watch, and no. it's just the worst. Again. No, I knew it was bad when I watched this movie. I knew it was bad, and I hated it while I watched it for the first time. It wasn't like Episode Seven where I was willing to give it a go. It and just slowly thinking, okay. chisels away at your heart. But, you yeah, know, you're but, right. Episode Seven was slowly getting worse and worse, and I was thinking, ah. But this movie was bad from the begin, from the very opening scene, and it only got worse. It was bad. It was so bad. In this movie, Ray, um, she learned to fight a light fight with lightsabers using a rock. Uh, she can have four Skype calls with Kylo whenever she wants, <laughs> and apparently, from totally across the galaxy, they can like share physical items and water and stuff. Like there's a there's a moment when like one of them gets wet, and then through the force somehow the other one gets wet like it doesn't make any sense she can beat luke in a fight she can speak wookie like god 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 no no there's do you remember the scene where um they are fighting in the red throne room and there's all those red armor guys and yeah that's a a visually captivating scene a visually striking scene but if you watch it again the choreography is so bad the dudes the red the red dudes are like prancing and spinning all around and like r- removing their guard a la ballet kind of yeah thing. it looks like a ballet and like it's totally not how a fight would go there's a point where ray like kicks someone but she actually she kicks one guy but three guys go flying backwards like they all got kicked like there's a point where one guy's weapon he's holding a knife and then it's a cgi knife of course and then his arm passes behind ray and then when it's comes out the other side the knife isn't there anymore it's just a cgi the, the the knife just is not there in his hand anymore like it's bad the way they kill snoke is bad snoke himself is bad <sighs> <laughs> so it gets a zero it can pay it a compliment what's the best thing you can say about it it's it's visually striking the settings are are good from an art from an art direction standpoint there are good things the x-wings look cool um like i said the hyperspace jump suicide bomb the the scene looks good um that's all i got that's all i got (laughs) um the i'll mention the themes the themes that i i took note of were tradition must be dismantled there's a line that says uh let the past die. Kill it if you have to. So, <laughs> I mean, how much more explicit can you get than that? Uh, bad things happening gives you an excuse to run and hide. Uh, the the positive theme is cute animals are important to protect. Um, because <laughs> yeah, they, that's agree uh, an agreeable thing. They, so they pro- stupid to say. They, I mean, it pops up multiple times. They protect the little horse goblin bat things on the casino planet. They protect the crystally foxes at the end, and they protect the cute-looking bird penguin things on Luke's island. And like that's a recurring theme in the movie. Of course, they don't do anything good, but um, sol- soldiers should obey orders unquestioningly. Uh, wealth can only come from evil. Failure and misfortune should be passed on so that lessons can be learned in the experience. This is This is blasphemous because they actually bring Yoda back to tell us that our duty is to force failure onto the next generation so that they understand failure, which is totally stupid. It's the job of the prior generation to guide the next generation to avoid failure, not to pander and to coddle them, but to encourage them to go out in the world and have their own experiences, hopefully success, not hopefully failure, hopefully success. This movie turns it on its head. Um, and then the other, when, when I mentioned it was borderline immoral, it was because of this. Uh, Finn has a line that says, at least you're stealing from the bad guys and helping the good. He's tacitly approving of um, the bad behavior of the hacker casino right, evil The, t- the dude. two wrongs make a right kind of, yeah. Yes. And, and then there's one last theme that pops up, which is save what you love, don't fight what you hate, which is a line from the Asian girl Rose. Uh, which Say that is, again for me save what you love don't fight what you hate uh which sounds good on its surface but it's another philosophical tenet that i hold which is you can't be 100 percent compassion and zero percent aggression which is what this suggests like you have to 
fight for things. You can't just save what you love. You can't be a person who only hugs. You have to be a person who hugs what you love and punch the people who are coming after you and trying to kill you. And this movie suggests that you can't you can't do that. You should essentially be a weak a weak pacifist who only right. hugs. And that's patently absurd from regardless of the political spectrum. Both sides are are are, are, are fight are fighting. So I wonder who they're even like anyway. <laughs> This yeah. to me sounds like Ryan Johnson is just a weak beta male guy with <laughs> with his weak subversive ideas, nihilistic ideas, who embedded all of his trash into a movie when he had his chance. That's what it sounds like to me. If I <laughs> saw Ryan Johnson in public somewhere, I would I, I would I would shoot him a bird and I would say, "Screw you." Uh, I hate you. <laughs> like, I, I really can't stand that guy for what he did to this. I, now, now in, this, in my Star Wars story, after I saw Episode Eight in theaters, I said, I'm done with Star Wars. I'm never watching right, Star Wars. Right, I remember that. Again. And you really didn't go see the... And, and I really didn't. I didn't see Episode, episode nine. 9. I didn't watch um, the Han Solo movie. I didn't watch The Mandalorian. I didn't buy any more books. I didn't do anything Star Wars anymore. And it was only because of the prospect of this podcast that I decided to to watch the stuff and just see if I was right or, or, or if I was wrong. Um, and, and so I'm, I watched. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so tell I, me what I watched, this last one. If I, my memory is very vague <laughs> on it, even though it's the most recent movie I saw. Just mega epic and, and yeah. a little, like, goofy. But <laughs> yeah. So episode nine, like goes, the, ri- the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about it. <laughs> what would you uh, give it? It's the best. It's the best of the sequel trilogy. Um, so I gave it a two out of ten. Uh, so, <laughs> so for a grand total, of for, three. for a grand total of three out of thirty possible points. Um, it this movie. So at least it wasn't subversive, especially when compared with Episode Eight. But even really when compared with Episode Seven, if I had to choose one word for this movie, it would be brainless. Um, it was a romp. Right. It was just an action romp through set pieces uh, with just a MacGuffin. It was a find the MacGuffin, there's a bad guy, and let's fight the bad guy. Find the MacGuffin, fight the bad guy. That was it. So it was very straightforward. You could compare it to, you know, episode four had a very simplistic plot as well. Um, The difference is that episode four had good characterization, uh, charm, and world building, and this movie totally lacked all of that. Um... So I guess the the primary gripe. Remind this movie, me, why am I going so epic? Wasn't there just something like all these ships yeah. or something like yeah. just like getting really funny? I mean, visually it was sort of a whoa kind Dude, of thing, but it was uh, just goofy, right? It was just like a kid it writing goofy. it and saying, "Make it even more, make it lots of badness." Like, yes, just, that's how it was. Like now, there's I guess they didn't want to do another bigger Death Star planet. And this time they decided to do thousands of Star Destroyers, and all the Star yes. Destroyers have Death Star guns on them. And no I mean, one... It was like a kid with copy-paste. With the it, was. I mean, it was. Well, there, goofy. There was a scene at, at during the climax of the movie when all the big, bad, scary Star Destroyers are like rising through the thunderstorm planet, yeah. and they're going yeah. to do bad stuff. And then to save the day, here comes... The civilian fleet and all of these civilian ships jump hyperspace jump in at the same time, which is ridiculous. You can't do that. Like they would collide into each other, <laughs> yeah, and it would have been yeah. ridiculous to coordinate. But there's thousands of all these different kinds of ships, and they're just filling space, which is ridiculous looking. And these two monstrous clouds of ships. Oh God, it was dumb. It was dumb. I mean, it wasn't as like I said, it wasn't disrespectful in the sense that episode eight was, but it was dumb. Um, and like I also thought, it was speaking of that moment. It was there was this little bit that I don't think they intended to suggest in the movie, but there was like this pro gun argument made by that scene in a way, pro Second Amendment, if you will, like in terms of the U- United States, because they said, "Who are these guys? Is it the is it the?" Uh, is it the Republic come to save us? And they're like, no, it's just a bunch of people with their own ships. And, <laughs> you know, it's the it's the whole idea that <laughs> individuals are the ones that can 
team up to fight evil, to fight the bad guys. You know, right. everyone has their own right. ship. Everyone has their own gun. It's the good guy with the ship with the ship that can fight the bad guys with the ships. And like that's true. So at yeah. least they nailed that. Um, <laughs> the the biggest problem the biggest problem with this movie was Emperor Palpatine came back. He's just literally zombie Palpatine. They just brought him back, uh, even though he died. In episode six, he got thrown down a shaft by Darth Vader, and it was Darth Vader's redemption moment. So it was the thing that made Darth Vader become redeemed, and Palpatine blew up in a big cloud of blue fire and stuff. He came back. I don't know how. They just resurrected his corpse. (laughs) Uh, Just goofy. Similar. Like, it's actually thematically appropriate because they resurrected the corpse of Star Wars um, with the sequel trilogy and so you know it kind of ties together how they resurrected Palpatine because they can't make a good villain um, right so just it was of, stupid I mean, it's recycle culture just sort of yeah you know it's it was weird. stupid we're seeing we're seeing the combination of we talked about throwaway culture you know instead of repairing throw away and and it's the same thing in movies we kill off people but we also are recycling uh both culturally we (laughs) see the values of recycling for for planet earth but we just are you know creatively vapid and recycle our characters so we we're killing off characters and then just putting them back in it's all it's all truly postmodern. it's all meaningless there's no there's no core (laughs) it's just oh god like what they should have done if they really wanted to have a compelling plot like they introduced new characters, they have Ray, Finn, and Kylo. Just, just make one of them the antagonist. Like truly make Kylo into something useful, and make him the bad guy. But they didn't. They waffled on it, and they tried to make that dramatic. Whether is he good or is he bad? Is he good or is he bad? And I, they just flip flopped back and forth and right. and, f- and failed. Um, so uh, there are, there's one other so. There's one other thing that I hated about this movie, and you might think that it's you know it's trivial, but the movie, if you remember, it's a MacGuffin movie. They they need to find this little triangle Which thing. Which is so is the first one. So these are just two MacGuffin movies. Yeah, like, it's ugh. a lot of MacGuffin movies, but they had to find this little pyramid-looking thing that was a map to where the emperor was essentially. And in order to find the, that MacGuffin, they eventually found another MacGuffin, which was this dagger. Uh, with a really weird shaped edge on it, and that MacGuffin was supposed to lead them to the map MacGuffin, which would then lead them to the Emperor. And there's this scene where they f- they finally acquire this dagger and they land on the planet. This is the planet apparently where the Death Star crashed, which doesn't make sense because the Death, Death Star got blown to smithereens. But the the actual visual design of this planet is really cool. It's a stormy planet with a uh, very um, rough waters in the ocean and you see the like superstructure of the death star crashed out in the ocean it looks really cool um but the death star is all crumpled and crashed it's the second death star so it's the one that wasn't constructed all the way and in order to find their way to the pyramid matt mcguffin the way they have to do it i'm not joking they stand apparently on a spot i don't know it was not it was just a rock somewhere and they hold the dagger up so that the edge, the jagged edge of the dagger, they hold it up and the camera like zooms behind the dagger and it matches up with the silhouette of the Death Star ruins. And apparently this little point on the dagger points to a spot on the Death Star ruins and inside that spot, that's where the Matt MacGuffin is. And it's so, that's, it's head shaking. that's yeah. stupid. How... Who could make that dagger MacGuffin point to the other MacGuffin, and why? How do you know where to stand? How do you know what the outline of the Death Star looks like? <laughs> and why? From what you, angle? Yeah. It was yeah. so dumb. That was that that made me that made me like hold my head in my hands uh, when that happened. Um, other than that, the movie was very empty. Uh, like there wasn't a lot of characterization. Um, Ray continued her uh, ability to do anything. She apparently could f- do force healing with no training. Um, she could heal far and underground giant snakes. She can grab ships out of the air with the force. She can use force lightning with no training. She can block blaster bolts with her hand with no training. She can fight the Emperor. Like, oh, that was stupid. Um, <laughs> if I had to, uh, if I had to praise the movie, the, the secondary characters in this movie were actually okay. There was this little repair guy, some little tiny alien who was repairing C-3PO, and 
he was charming. It was a charming little alien character. That was good. There was even some uh, secondary character who was like a Daft Punk girl. I don't know what her name was, but she looked like Daft Punk. She was okay. She was fine. Secondary characters were all right. The visual design was, again, pretty good. The pacing was pretty good, even though it was nothing amazing. Um, it was a MacGuffin movie, but the pacing was okay. Um, the, the It wasn't subversive. The themes weren't great, but they weren't terrible. The theme was basically authenticity. Uh, it was about Rey and her lineage. Um, she had a line that said, People keep telling me they know me. I'm afraid no one does. So it was kind of this teenage I don't know who I am sort of thing. Which, um, is that consistent with her character at this point? No, I mean, no. That, because this is, this is what I talk about, it, the three movies being disjointed, because in episode seven... It, it was clearly wanting us to believe that Rey was related to Luke. And when she touched Luke's yeah. lightsaber, oh, she had a... Yeah, did she, they ever revisit that? I forgot nope. about that. That disappeared. That totally disappeared. Um, but they, oh So gosh. the hint was family matters. She's a part of the Skywalker family. And then in episode eight, Ryan Johnson, his we discovered that Rey actually was a nobody. Her parents were nobodies. They just abandoned her on her desert planet and family doesn't matter. That was the theme of episode eight. And then in episode nine, we learn, oh, wait, no, actually, Rey is Palpatine's granddaughter. Her family does matter again, and now she's conflicted because she is the granddaughter of a bad guy. And so, <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, we have an idiotic line where she calls herself Rey Skywalker, and which doesn't make sense because she's not related to Luke. And it was I mean, just, is that a way of acknowledging those those weird connections i mean i just don't get it it doesn't make sense the name of the movie is the rise of skywalker after they killed luke skywalker in the previous movie so it doesn't make sense either um painful man (laughs) so it it was bad there were tons ended uh, on a high note for the for the trilogy though (laughs) well yeah for the trilogy yeah also they did one other weird thing which they made ray and kylo kiss each other after after they beat the emperor and that was weird because they didn't have like romance vibes they just kissed each other somehow and then kylo died <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was i don't know yeah whatever that... <laughs> it's just so bad all right so does that satisfy you for the it uh, does the sequel it trilogy does. i just so a score of 26 a score of uh what was it 17 uh, 17 wasn't it? yeah and then a and score three. of three <laughs> The trajectory of Star Wars is uh, not looking good, man. Pretty bad. Well, let me um, let me turn things around a little bit with the Mandalorian. Uh, I didn't I didn't keep the same kind of notes since it was a TV series, uh, so it, I wasn't as detailed on these. But there are two seasons of the Mandalorian, and there are eight episodes each, I believe, and it is really good. I mean, it's it's quality. Season one, I gave an eight out of ten. Um, it feels like a western uh it feels kind of like there's a another sci-fi show called firefly which is, has you western reference vibes. It's basically a western set yeah yeah and, and so this, this is kind of played out this is yeah that's how it played out this is kind of lone gunman badass doesn't talk a lot goes to different places and has little episodic adventures and he has an overarching goal to deliver the baby yoda um to a place uh and it's really solid um the episodes are well written it doesn't it's not campy um it has engaging uh uh, little little plot lines it's super respectful of the star wars lore there are almost no mistakes that i could find in season one anyway in terms of how things worked what the world should be like the art direction was fantastic they had lots of little um easter eggs from from the lore uh let's see um they had some cameos that were good bill burr showed up in an episode and actually did a good job it was actually probably the best episode of the show um Interesting gus, to do gus from yeah. breaking bad was the main bad guy um and he did okay baby yoda now before i watched the mandalorian i you know baby yoda became really popular and i saw it and i thought this is stupid. Yoda died. He didn't have a baby. Why is there a baby Yoda? And I was ready to dislike it, but they right. did, it, it wasn't bad. It was fine. Baby Yoda wasn't annoying. Um, 
it's odd that he exists, but it's not it's not impossible that he exists. So whatever, I'm okay with it. I was okay with Baby Yoda. Um, and then the themes the themes were solid too. It was about independence, honor, and there was another another thing that they hit multiple times, which is droids are not good or bad. They're a reflection of those who program them, uh, which I thought was an interesting That's theme. That's interesting. That is, yeah. To include, um, I like the idea. I would like that theme to be explored more. And is that? Uh, could you apply that to other like machinery in our culture? Like, certainly. I mean, it sounds like a gun theme, right? Yeah, like guns, it does. guns are tools, and it's not the guns that cause problems; it's the people that use them, which is a theme I agree with. I just didn't expect it to be applied to droids, and actually, I think it might not apply to droids in the Star Wars universe, right? So it's a theme that I find intellectually interesting and I would like to be explored more. I was just surprised to see it included in the in the series. Yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, season two started to dip, or it did dip in quality. I gave it a six out of 10. Uh, yeah, it... It it's it lost a little bit of his if of its identity. It wasn't so much a lone wolf with a mission show. It introduced a lot of secondary characters, fan service characters. So like, there's a character from the Clone Wars called Ahsoka who's a Jedi, and somehow she showed up again. That was weird. The, you found some other Mandalorians, and they were terrible. They were obnoxious. Like, um, uh, they were all they were all women, and like it just was there their physical prowess was unbelievable. Uh, when, and I hate when that happens. It's not even, like, if you're a female Jedi, then you have the excuse that you are you have the Force, and that's fine. But these were just normal women, and they just had armor on. And this armor must weigh hundreds of pounds, and yet they were, like, cartwheeling and flip-flopping and punching through doors and crap. Um, it just didn't make any sense. Um, and then... Uh, they, they Near the end, they introduced these stupid-looking droids that looked like Iron Man and they were supposed to be real scary, but they came off just being dumb. They were punching through doors, like literally big blast doors and they were like punching through them. It was stupid. Uh, and then the only other thing I'll comment on, they brought Boba Fett back. He should have been dead. Um, and then they brought Luke Skywalker in for the last episode. Major spoiler. Uh, Luke Skywalker came in and was a badass, uh, but he was totally CGI, which was kind of weird. Um, uh, but, but I will say this, like, even though he was totally CGI and it was a little uncanny, he was so much better than sequel trilogy Luke that I would I would be okay with seeing a Star Wars movie starring CGI Luke instead. Like, if they would have <laughs> just done, if they would have made uh, the sequel trilogy, the Thrawn, you know, the Thrawn books, and it would have been CGI Luke, it would have been far and away better than what we actually got. Um and so well, that was that was my take on the Mandalorian. Overall, worth watching. It was it was actually quality. Um, I wouldn't pay for it. I wouldn't give any money to to Disney ever again. I don't intend to uh, because of episode seven, eight, and nine. I won't watch the Obi Wan show that's come out. Uh, at least I certainly won't pay for it. And I do think Star Wars is dead. The Mandalorian is just kind of like when you're dead and you twitch a little afterwards. That's kind of what happens. <laughs> well, that, that, that gave you... So that was a I like, lot. I like that we've now documented your, your thoughts on the... Like we have a, a time capsule almost of uh, your thoughts on, <laughs> on, on, on these. You know, we have a right. two and a half hour time capsule. Two and a half. I know it's really... I told you, I told you it was going to be long because there was just a lot to get through. And believe me, I skipped a lot. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, uh, I didn't want I didn't want to belabor it, but I knew it was going to be long. I, who knows what the future holds? Maybe Disney will, you know, come to their senses, and they have already tossed out a bunch of Star Wars into the trash can. Maybe someone will come along and toss all this into the trash can and reboot it. But yeah, I'm not optimistic. I think we that'd just that'd be need the new, best thing to do. But... That'd be the best thing for Star Wars. But I think we just need new good stories um, instead of rehashing the old stuff and destroying the it's just time for yeah you can do it within star wars world but just tell a good story and revisit the the classic thematic elements that's that's what you need yeah well that's well that's enough that's enough (laughs) 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 (laughs)